Bong, bong, bong. A little sound check there, Michael, please. Uh, testing one, two, three. That's one, very, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort About, of, I'm a bit close. Yeah, an average okay. male's length between okay. you and the mic would be uh, right. Would be good. Is that is that the test they do? Is that how big you know, God, We've already started. Only smaller hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, here we go then. This is uh, this is it. This is the first one. Wow. I'm Welcome. Honoured. Well, I mean, to be here at the beginning of your journey. The beginning of all things. It's, yeah. like, like, it's like a Lord of the Rings quote. That's it. So, uh, so yeah, we have um, Michael Neves with us, uh, the stalwart of motorcycle journalism in the UK. Um, are you probably the oldest running continuous motorcycle journalist? Probably full time. Yeah. Employed. I think yeah. there's uh, some freelancers that have been going a little bit longer than me, including your very own Chris Moss. Yeah, I mean, he's been going a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's the Alan Cathcarts of the world. Yes. He's been going since motorcycles were invented, probably. <laughs> and you've been MCN the whole way? Yep, since 2002. So how did you get into that? I won my job in a competition. You won your job? I won my job in a competition. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been into bikes since I was 16. I'm not one of these people that grew up with bikes. Um, more cars more than anything which is why it's so cool to be here today surrounded by Porsches yeah I should just jump in and yeah. say we are we are at uh, RPM Technic which is in just outside Aylesbury and uh, there's a fantastic selection of yeah. uh, motor vehicles here um, so we hopefully we'll get a little walk around in a bit so a big thanks for for them uh, to allow us to sit upstairs in the, in their little uh, showroom and a nice little uh, 92, 93? Yeah, well, we were, and again, we were just chatting. We, we both had a 964, 911, didn't yeah. we? And yeah. uh, the, the crime of selling it or getting rid of it. Well, you wrapped yours around a tree. I, I put mine into a lamppost just to <laughs> save the hassle of selling it. Do you know what? It's kind of just take the insurance money. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, the uh, the lift off oversteer got the better of me. They were, uh, they were quite um, a great. So, yeah, we should say both of ours were turbos, weren't they? Yeah. So, the yeah. turbo two. And um, below. 3,000 RPM, there was nothing there, was it? No. It was just gutless. It was yeah. like, uh, and then all of a sudden, halfway around a roundabout in the rain, this massive single boost turbo would kick in and just absolutely throw you off exactly. into, the, into the undergrowth, <laughs> which made for an exciting vehicle. Yeah, exactly. Um, it wasn't the easiest thing to drive, but bloody hell, what a thing. Yeah. I, got, I always wanted one. My, my dad had a few when we were growing up, not because he was wealthy, but he just he managed to buy some old clonkers 911s were quite cheap, um, sort of in the late seventies and early eighties when he had a couple, and um, I always, I always wanted one, and I could never afford one. But the reason I got mine was through some compensation from it for an injury, basically. So I had a really bad motorbike accident on the road in '94, and uh, got a good payout. The the most that you could get without losing your legs, basically, without an amputation. So it was, a, it was a decent, but I was, I was really badly injured. Uh, and I got this compensation money in 97 and decided to be sensible with half of it. And I put a deposit down on the house and stupid with the other half. And I bought a 911 Turbo, <laughs> <laughs> which only lasted me about a year and a half, unfortunately. But wow. yeah, one of my big regrets, not, not keeping that. But I think that if I would have kept it, I think the decision to leave my old life down in Ramsgate, where I used to live, and join MCN, where I won this competition, I think might have been harder because um, there was this, this competition called Road Test Idol. And um, I'd always, I'd race when I was younger and always wanted to be involved with riding bikes for a living and always thought that dream was unachievable. And it definitely was then, perhaps not, not so much now in this new era where we, we can talk about more, you know, um, influencers and Instagrammers or whatever. But then it was completely unachievable. And this thing came up in MCN during the summer of 2002. So they needed a new road tester, basically. Rather than advertise it in a normal way, they ran it as a competition. Win your dream job as a road tester. And they badged it up uh, Road Test Idol. And that actually... Was, it, was that before Pop Idol? Well, or they was that, stolen that... the idea. Right. And they <laughs> even had the same logo and just substituted Pop for oh, Road Test. Oh, the days before copyright. Exactly. Yeah. So... Um, I thought, blimey, I'm going to enter. And I'd actually applied for a job at Superbike magazine, who, who'd advertised for a road tester normally. And I got a thanks, but no thanks from that. And I thought, oh. 
And then this thing came up in it, uh, MCN. You had to fill out a coupon. Which do you prefer, bikes or sex? 50 words. So completely arbitrary. Uh, and dem um, send a picture demonstrating your love of bikes. So I, I sent in a picture of me on a track day uh, at Lydon Hill Circuit on a 916, close nice. to your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there was a series of knockout rounds. I think about 3,000 people entered. And then wow. it was whittled down to knowing what I know now about MCN, they would have probably just thrown most of those entries in the bin. Couldn't be bothered to read them. Well, you can't go through three. Th and, and also judge somebody if they're going to be any good at a job, you know, 50 words, bites yeah. or sex. So it was pretty lucky that I got through to the first 100 where they started this proper knockout kind of rounds. And it started off as bike knowledge tests and it got whittled down to feature writing, road riding, prowess, some track riding stuff at California Superbike School. And then it was whittled down to three finalists. So did you actually do the tests so that you actually, actually had to do stuff? Yeah. Okay. So. And this is before video yeah. days. Although some of the process was actually filmed on a men and motors show called Bikes Allowed. Do you remember that? I do, I, I've seen a couple. Yeah. Wasn't Richard Hammond on that? No, it was, he might have been on some. Mossy was on a few. Was he? Because there's a, every now and again, an old Men and Motors video pops up on YouTube about some random bike, yeah. something like a test from the 90s or whatever. That's it. So, yeah. I think Louise Brady. Do you remember her? She, no. But anyway, so some, some of it was um, shown on that. So as leading up to you know, me getting this job, I, I was got closer and closer and thought, you know, this is the sort of thing that doesn't normally happen to people. You know? I thought, blimey, I might, I might get this job. So I spoke to my, I was working for a sign manufacturer as a project manager at the time down in Ramsgate. And um, I said, look, I'm, I've entered this competition. I might win it. I probably won't, but I might win it. And uh, so eventually these, the three finalists got featured in the paper with a telephone number and it was a public vote. So all my friends and family just ringing, ringing, ringing. So was I, probably to get rid of me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, 200 pound a minute. That's it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And one Friday morning, I was in the uh, kind of filing room at this sign company and phone went and it was MCN and said, you got the job. So they said the thing... And, and what year was that? Sorry? This was 2002, oh. um, about September time. And they said two things. Number one, we want you to start a week on Monday because we want to put you through some journalism training. And number two, we thought that some spotty 16-year-old was going to get the job and we've set aside money for a spotty 16-year-old. And I was 32 at the time. I had a, this job in the sign company. It was a decent job. And I thought, oh, crikey. I, I couldn't actually afford to do it. Mm. But I thought if I don't do it, I'll regret it for forever. So I said yes. And, you know, st suddenly started feeling nervous. I had to go and tell my boss, you know, I've got the job. I'm leaving. Blah, blah, blah. And then sort of the end of that week, gave my company car back, packed all my belongings into my car and drove to Peterborough where the office is. And did, you still have, did you still have the turbo then? I had, because I crashed it, I had a Lotus Elise. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah so my turbo, my, my broken legs had turned into a Porsche and then the Porsche turned into <laughs> a, a Lotus. So I basically just crammed as much as I could into this little roller skate of a car yeah. and lived in a travel lodge in Peterborough for about three or four weeks while I was doing this training. And I remember the first night, because I didn't actually go into the MCN office, I went into a training room to be a journalist. I think, God, have I done the right thing? You know, you know, I just thought I'd go straight in and sit on a fire blade and go and race around the track. There you go. Okay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Here's the keys, mate. What do you think? Yeah, so it was, it was a strange introduction to being a journalist. And I really think from day one, I've kind of had imposter, imposter syndrome because of it, you know, because I didn't get into it properly. It was always a world that was... I thought you had to be a national level race, racer to do it, university level journalist. Obviously, you don't. <laughs> it's it, John, that is that is staggering to hear that you have imposter syndrome because from from me feeling we've we've, <clears throat> we've come into this this world as from very different environments. Yeah. I definitely felt like I had imposter syndrome. You know when I went from riding around on a, uh, a GSXR through London shouting at taxis to then suddenly being on a launch of uh, KTM or whatever down yeah. in Spain. And you're kind of like, uh, and, and that was just at the, 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 the sort of transfer point. Now it's, we're used to it, aren't we? we, we there's, yeah. there's often, in fact, manufacturers often run a, a press group and a influencer group, don't they? Yeah. 
at most of these events now. So it's just a common, <coughs> it is what it is. But then, you know, you'd be on the plane and it'd be, you, you'd almost hear the whispers like, what's this guy doing here? He doesn't yeah, deserve yeah. to be here. Like, what's he done? Yeah. And I was like, nothing, mate, but... <laughs> You know, I'll and now it, look. I'll give it, yeah, and now look. Now, now I'm on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now we, we kind of feel like the dinosaurs because the manufacturers really have turned, turned, you know, to look for their online presence is more important. Than Do you know, it, it's such a crazy, like just hearing you talk about MCM back there in the late 90s and the, and the noughties when you, when you got the job there. And, and obviously you've been reading the magazine and you've been into bikes that whole time. Yeah. Uh, the amount of money in the industry back then the amount of weight that those big magazines had yeah and this is only really 20 years ago and the decline of, as, mm. as such didn't really start happening until the last eight years That's probably it. yeah so it's just the whole industry has gone through this crazy transition and everyone's a little bit what's going on yeah. I, I think even even you know, that imposter syndrome you talk about i think even you know, traditional journal like media companies are now. Oh, we need to be a social media side, mm. and I think they don't know what they're doing. No, but I think as the older I get, the more I realise that m most people, most companies, most uh, people you look from the outside think, oh, they've got their shit together. They don't really know what's going no. on. Most people are, are just winging it. Yeah, and and when you figure that out, and you think, and you realise that the person you're sitting opposite on a table trying to impress is probably trying to impress you just as much. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, okay. Everyone's just, <laughs> everyone's kind of talking a bit of, of um, yeah, not talking shit, but like just trying to make the best of their situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's mad to hear that you, you felt, felt yeah, that. Yeah. And you, st you still do. I still do because, you know, I'm surrounded by really intelligent people in, in my world, in MCN, because... I don't really have a lot to do with other road testers. Most of my kind of interaction with my colleagues are designers and sub-editors and editors and hmm. clever writers. So yeah. I still feel like this. Well, you're oink. pretty much the only road tester. I mean, there's Carl now. With Carl him. Stevens, who's yeah. just joined us now. Yeah, Top lad. Yeah, Top lad, exactly. <clears throat> but yeah, when I, when I joined, road testers, they were like heroes to me. When I was reading, um, well, even MCN, but PB in the late 80s and early 90s. and Two wheels only. Two wheels only, fast bikes. Those, those guys were as, as heroic to me as the racers. So mm. I remember going on my first launch, which was a Z1000 in uh, 2000, end of 2002. Yeah. And it was, I don't know if you remember. I'm just going to pop this microphone a little bit. Okay. So do you remember the, the Z1000, it had the, kind of the twin stacked exhaust coming out each side? The first one, 2004, the, the Widowmaker. Yeah. yeah. So we went, I went on that launch, but I didn't have to do anything because MCN had already been on a sort of a, a secret launch in Japan. So okay. I just went to, you know, just film my feet. Exactly. And it was in Sorrento. We flew to Sorrento and I was thinking, God, is this an actually, you know, this is... And, and fa in fairness to MCN, when I joined, that didn't make me make the tea. Once I'd done my journalist training, I was straight mm. out doing the job. But I remember seeing all the other journalists, you know, and I remember being in a reception of the hotel at uh, Sorrento when everyone had just laid their crash helmets out on the table before we went out for a ride and recognising everyone's custom yeah. lids. It doesn't happen so much now. No one's got them. I don't know. I mean, I've got a Nevesy rep somewhere in <laughs> yeah. a shed that Arai did, I think, didn't they? <laughs> with, your, with your plants in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just remember seeing um, uh, John Cantley, Sonic. Uh, he was Sonic. Uh, Warren Pole, Chad. You know, Chad, yeah. Chad, who I later worked with, just thinking, bloody hell, you know, this is unbelievable. And I still feel like that now. And it's, and again, the, it's not, not only those magazines and those publications. I, I think, hang on, let's rewind a bit. I think the whole industry, the cause for the industry change is financial. Mm. Because again, back then, and this was way before I was even, I, I didn't even pass my bike test till 2008. Right. Like, I was, you know, just wasn't interested. Um, but just looking back through time, you can see where the money stopped being pumped into these the big magazines because mm. that was if you were if you were Yamaha, Ducati, whatever, where would you put your money? You'd, you'd smash it all into yeah. these mags, yeah, yeah. Which is why they had decent budget to do amazing stuff, and they were these legends, as you say. And um, 
the, the launches were, you know, it wouldn't be unheard of to get a private jet from Honda, would it? And be flown out to, you uh, know, yeah. w- wherever. Whereas now you're lucky to get a, a sandwich on your Ryanair flight from Luton at four in the morning. Yeah. The whole, the whole industry has, has changed and that, that kind of, um, that, that, that glamour, if I, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because I didn't experience the glamour. So I don't think what's missing. But do you, do you ever sort of think when you, you know, you've got three flights a week. That's probably average for you, isn't it? Three Sometimes. Sort of destinations. Yeah. You know, you well, up at four in the morning, tra- train on here. Do you ever think, oh, what happened? Do you know, I actually probably miss the real glamour. I think the real glamour was in the 90s when yeah. it, there really was, you know, unlimited money sloshing around. But I did kind of did get the... When I joined, MCM was selling uh, maybe 145,000 copies a week. Which is massive, isn't it? That Bike is magazine would be 100,000. So, yeah, there was a lot of money in the coffers and there. fast bikes. Fast bikes. Were, I don't know what they were saying, but they would have been big, wouldn't they? Yeah. But we had a That's lot of... That's the one I remember. And yeah. I was really into bikes. It was just the one that sort of was... <clears throat> that, for me, that, for me, felt the renegade one. It was a bit more... Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, a bit more... Like, they, they did a couple of videos with, like, Shaky and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, and they're YouTube. legendary, just, aren't they? I mean, we can talk about YouTube and algorithm and blocking and you know all that sort of <laughs> yeah. stuff later. But yeah, they're still on there. If yeah. You want to go and search them out. Um, but I think the thing that's the thing that's changed the most with regard to the money side of things, the manufacturers' launches are pretty similar for me. I think the days of the first class travel were a little bit before my time. Although there still were those trips. I remember going to Phillip Island, flying there with Suzuki for the K6, GSXR, 750 and 600 first class. Yeah, being flown on a private jet on a Michelin launch. So, you know, you get the odd bit. And it does sound spoiled to say, okay, I don't want to take a Ryanair flight at four in the morning and have a crappy sandwich because a lot of people would dream of that still, wouldn't they, who have got their jobs, they're living, they're, they're living for their weekends. And we get... Yeah. Every day is a weekend for us. We're yeah, lucky. Yeah, they, they would. But just, you know, when you've got to do it three times a week, mm. it, it is difficult. It is hard work. It is. You know, and then you're like, oh, I've got to say something different about this bike. And, you know, it is, it's, not, it's not easy. I mean, I'm, again, I'm lucky because the way I end up doing it is I jump on the bike, I put a camera on, and I yeah. say what I say. Yeah. And then there might be a bit of a roundup at the end if I've missed anything. Mm. But that's pretty much, that's yeah. pretty much it. Um, but if you have to, if you've got a proper job, <laughs> yeah. and you've got to write several stories based on the same bike for different publications, it must be quite yeah, a taxing. That, that's what's changed the most for me is the amount of work at a launch. Really, you know, before it was just we'd always had to turn things around fast because MCNs are, are weekly. But um, you know, now you're feeding the MCN machine, you're feed, feeding the social media machine, the YouTube machine, the web machine, the other magazines as well. And there's a lot less of you there right? yeah exactly so yeah I'm, I'm doing more but um with regard to the amount of money to spend the, the the kind of the test that we instigated ourselves has changed a lot you know back in 2003 or 4 if a new zx6r came out for example and it came out in december we would think nothing about loading it in the back of a van and driving it to the south of france to, to test it because mm. you just can't do that now no so that they're the days that have gone and that's that's what i miss that those are the bits i love yeah and we still try and do that on 44 teeth we we try but you, you've got to take the the hit on the finances because yeah. you it's not you can you can fiddle the books as much as you want it's you're not going to make the money uh unless you've got a very decent sponsor behind you that's mm-hmm. going to pay for it and yeah. it's and it ain't cheap you yeah. know <laughs> flying somewhere is ridiculously cheap these days. You know, you yeah. can you can jump on a plane for a hundred quid. Cheaper return. than the car park when you're there. Cheaper than the car park at Gatwick. Yeah. yeah. Or Luton if your car burns down because there's <laughs> yeah. a fire. Um so but we 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 still try and do that because that's what the magic <clears throat> is for me about doing these mm. things. It's it's the camaraderie, it's the laugh. And as soon as it stops becoming that and you end up on the trudge, it doesn't matter if you're on a plane to sunny Spain or if you're on a train to St Albans mm. in November, you're still going to work, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think, uh, yeah, it's a shame that that it's become expected that those big jobs don't happen. Mm. Um, but you we know, still occasionally get to do nice things. I mean, it's all nice, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I suppose just quickly, sorry, it, it's it's like because 
everyone, we, we all love bikes. Yeah. Which is why if you want a job in the bike industry, be prepared to earn 30% less yeah, than exactly. your mates. Yeah. Because there's always someone around the corner who would do the job for less than you because they exactly. just want to ride bikes. And that is, the, that's what, that's what the, the industry personnel have had to deal with over the last 20 years is gone well yeah the money's drying up but if you still want to do the job and you love it you'll make it work yeah, and yeah. it's like well i do really like bikes yeah, exactly <laughs> and, then, and then you're sort of just stuck there aren't yeah you? yeah um well you couldn't do this job if you didn't like bikes because yeah no. for maybe for the first year you could you know because the, the travel's fantastic you know you get an opportunity to travel the world and ride all these bikes but once the bike stopped being fun you're kind of just left with Travel's no fun, is it? After after a while, and no, I'm getting pretty. I'm getting particularly. Uh, I find it particularly difficult to travel these days. Mm. I, I find particularly since the whole pandemic thing as well. It just feels that the airlines are struggling, the airports are struggling. Everyone's out to just take your money, <clears throat> and it's so common now for the afternoon or later flights to be cancelled, moved, delayed. It, it's you know it, it it's becoming a real hard slog to travel now. It's not yeah. like oh great we're going to the lounge and we're going to do some stuff and the yeah, plane's yeah. always on time. It's like oh well it's late. Get used to it. It's like everyone expected plane. You're lucky you should, you're lucky you're flying anywhere. Yeah. You yes. know we're still here. We're still working for you. Yeah. You're lucky to get a ba. I mean a ba sandwich. You know on a, on a flight now is like a wet. Well you don't even get that. It's a packet of crisps in a packet of crisps. Yeah. British, British bloody Airways. <laughs> no. We um. Launches, I suppose, are about maybe a third yeah, of my working just, life, I'm really. Just point this more into your mouth. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, launch season for me is probably, it gets earlier and earlier. Sometimes it starts in August for the next year's bikes and ends sometimes in May. So most of my kind of winter is spent doing launches. But then during the summer, we sort of instigate our own test and sometimes we do some really cool stuff too. We, we've got to just think harder about making it work for the, the funds that you've got. Um, you know, if we can, for example, in the summer we did um, a week in Sicily testing some adventure bikes and some sports bikes and if you can organise the logistics in a way that you can spin a lot of tests out of those same bikes and situation, then, you know, you can still get to, you mm. still get to have fun and enjoy, enjoy the reason you're a road tester. Yeah. I remember we'd, when we did the, the first R1, the road bike to race bike yep. videos down in Almeria, we had two other tests there. So Ducati were at Andalusia on the That's it. SP Street, Street Fighter. Fighter. Yeah. And was it BMW? Who, was, who else was on track? You, you were testing the F900, weren't you? Yeah, we had, yeah, we had a few days on track with, the, with BMW for the F900. Yeah. So we had, it was like, do you know what? Actually, we can make this work. So we, we traveled down there. We rented an <coughs> apartment for a whole week because we were there. Amazing apartment, actually, in Almeria. Yeah. Have, you, have you stayed in Almeria town? Uh, no. Because you never do on launch. You no, that's stay in right. Mahaka or something. Yeah, same. It's, it's like Spain with no English people. Oh, it's, re it's, it's quite it's, rare. It's very rare because, you, you, as you know, you travel everywhere and it's like, hola, Sonia, dos cervezos, por favor. Yeah, yeah. But it's like a real working town. It's it's amazing. Oh, it's wow. really cheap, good value. So if yeah, you're yeah. after a top holiday tip. And, Maria's a and the circuit's not bad either. I mean, I, it's, it's a good question, actually. I mean, Almeria is one of those places like, oh, you're off to Almeria. But it's a tough, tough test track, isn't it, Almeria? Mm. It's not an easy place. You can't turn up there on day one no. and go, I'm going to go really fast around here. Whereas Hareth or somewhere like that, you, you kind of, by the first few sessions, you've, you, you know roughly yeah, yeah. what's going on and you could just sort of, so England. blind, isn't it, Al Maria? Yeah. Um, it's one of your favourites, though, isn't it? Because I feel I've been there quite a lot, so I feel like yeah. I have an advantage over other people because I do know it pretty well. Yeah, yeah. And it's not for a, a skill advantage, certainly not. It's more, it's like, I know where the track, I know, I know this bump, I know this, mm. I know that. And so I, I, do, I do like it for that reason. But yeah. I guess... In fact, one of the questions we had last night was, um, what's your favourite track in, well, I think, I guess that's the world. In the world. So you, it could be, you can be talking about Lydon Hill. Yeah. Or Phillip Island. Well, it used to be Lydon because it was my local track. I only lived about yeah. 15 miles away in Ramsgate. So I kind of, that was my I've first ever. I've never been it. That's the one that's also got the sort of muddy cross, rally cross. Rally cross stuff. It's kind of a mirror image of Brands Hatch, actually, strangely, and almost the same size. 
think Brands Hatch is a mile and point one. Lydon's just under a mile. Right, okay. And almost in the same place. Yeah, it's not far. Relative. Yeah, so that used to be my favourite track just because it was close. But I would say now it's hard to choose a favourite. It would be the top five would be Magello, mm. one of your favourites as well. Yeah. Philip yeah. Island, Brands GP, uh, Nürburgring, the full track. The Neutschleife. The Neutschleife uh, and Hereth, I'd say. Yeah, there's definitely two in there I would choose is Hereth and Mugello. Yeah. I mean, I've never really done, I haven't done many sort of what we'd call flyaways on mm. the World Superbike circuit. So I, I, I've done quite a lot in Europe, but very little. I've never been to Qatar, which is crazy because that's like a road testers yeah. back garden, isn't it? I mean, yeah. everyone's at Qatar, aren't they? Yeah. All the time. I, I think probably because it's cheap, if not free to hire from the manufacturers because they just want people to go there. Um, which is why everyone gets shipped out, shipped out yeah. to, to Qatar. But yeah, I've never been there. I did Abu Dhabi. Yeah, that's good. Was that a Bridgestone that thing? That was a Bridgestone. Yeah. You... No, I didn't do it. Chad was on that one. Chad was on that. But that, I mean, that's not, it's not a bike track. That. No. It's, it's right angles and, Yeah, you know, it's pretty clumsy on a bike. It is clumsy, but a fantastic experience. Yeah, yeah. it's like but, being in a video game, isn't it? Yeah, it's just on, off, on, off, on, off. I mean, the first one, two three four corners down to that hairpin is quite nice you get mm. some nice sweeping i mean it's amazing the difference on what circuits suit motorcycles mm. and how much fun i mean have you ever done cota as well yeah because that first say, section of cota is similar yeah it was ironic because um when we did uh, abu dhabi it was the launch of the first panigale the 1199 i bet that was an absolute pig round there wasn't yeah it? <laughs> but it was strange because it was so different to the 1198 that it was, I mean, it was better than that around the track. It had a lot wow. of advantages. We, we took, I mean, this is, you know, when we had more money, we took Neil Hodson with us as a kind of a guest tester yeah. uh, to give his opinion as well. Um, but then Cota, we did the 1199R for that one. And that was, yeah, the Cota is similar. It's quite clumsy. It's not really a bike track. It's too, st well, the but corners double section, back on themselves. That first section looks really nice. Yeah. Like the top of the track, sort of after turn one, which looks horrible. But then you sweep yeah. down that two, three, four, left, right, left, right, left, right. And it's all the colours on the track. But like Abu Dhabi, you know, the mm. painted curves and the, the blue. Yeah, and Paul Ricard. Paul Ricard. Paul Ricard. Yeah. Paul Ricard. What, that, in fact, that's, that's my... Well, you did the Yamaha there. Yeah, that might be right, right up there with one of my oh, top really? tracks as well. And when I first got there, or you see it on World Endurance, don't you? And be like, God, that looks like a nightmare. Like, yeah, how yeah. do you know where to go? There's all these lines everywhere. But actually, it's a really nice circuit to ride. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. We did uh, been there twice. Once on the launch of the 2012 F3 MV Augusta. Mm -hmm. Actually, the week leading up to going to Abu Dhabi, so that was a good week. That's a very um, good week, yeah. But the bike wasn't great. The MVs, there was their first go at um, the, the ride six by wire. 675. 675 yeah. was awful. And then, uh, well, before that, I did a launch of a Benelli Tornado. Do you remember that? With the little fa with the, the fans, fans at the back, yeah, and it was with yeah, what um, year was that? It must have been two thousand three or four, something right, like okay, that. Yeah, yeah, It was yeah. the first full production bike because they made a limited edition that they um, raced in World Superbike. And again, it's funny you mentioned <clears throat> that Benelli Tornado. I was talking; I think it might have been Al. We were, we, were, we were chatting about budget bike battle bikes because those tornadoes for a long, long time were like two grand, sat right at the bottom of the sports bike market because mm. they were just. Yeah. Weird and unpopular yeah. and you know, what's Pretty that? rubbish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now they're like 12 grand. No. Yeah. Yeah, because they couldn't give them away. They were just stuck in dealers for ages, weren't they? And I, I guess it's, oh, it's rare. It's rare, super rare, mm. but yeah, because no one wanted it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember being in the pit lane with, or in the pit area with Adrian Morton, who designed it. He used to work for MV Augusta as well. I know Adrian. He's yeah. A, yeah, so he, he did the new uh, super... Veloce. Super Veloce, yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made, I was still wet behind the ears, mm. and I had to write my test when I was there in between sessions, yeah. which I later found out that was going to be the norm. It wasn't a one off. And I made the mistake of showing him my words, which I'd never do now because I always think when I, when I write, I'm not, I'm not a natural born writer, so, and I have to write really quickly, which I, I still find a struggle now. So I'll write a draft, which I. Th is my undercoat and then you check it again and you're putting your foot, you know, if, if I had, if I had weeks, like if I was a magazine journalist to craft it, it would be amazing. But I've, you, at, at some point you've got to stop putting your top coats on and just, mm. just hand it in. And I showed Adrian Morton my words in his undercoat stage and fucking hell. 
it, it just cringy when I think back at it. And he just looked at it and sort of humoured me. Oh, that was all right, but it must have been awful. I've never shown anyone my words since. No, you know, the, in the undercoat scars, form. Scars are but Adrian, he's a nice. He's, not he's like a really a, nice guy. He's not like a. He wouldn't have. No, know, no, no, not at all. He's really, really nice guy, nice guy. and really enthusiastic and a really good rider. And mm. yeah, it's, again, it's 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 funny hearing your vulnerability because or what you mm. your per perceived vulnerability because I I don't want to blow too much smoke up your ass, but I see you as the consummate <clears throat> professional. I see you as you, you never say the wrong thing. Um, of course, opinions are yeah. subjective and it, it, it's very difficult to remain, you're a sports bike guy, you know, whatever, you don't like this, you don't like that. Um, but I, yeah, I, I see you as the industry, like the, the journalist, wow. the go-to one. Like, I, I, honestly, I don't think in terms of bike review reporting, I don't think there's anyone That's nice close to, say. to you, to be honest. I think from day one, my first big proper test was the 2004 Fireblade, the one undersea pipe, mm. which was a big deal for Honda then because it was the RCV style, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was kind of that first of the generation. What was what, what uh, rivaled that bike? It was the undersea pipe R1, wasn't it? The first ZX10. And the, and the uh, just, just getting into the, yeah, the K5 yeah. came and ruined it. And it was peak, peak super bike frenzy for everyone, wasn't it? Yeah, that one had the slightly... Like fatter belly, didn't it? That That's one, it. and then it got sort of revised in yeah. two thousand six, seven. Yeah, I remember writing that and thinking, well, I've never ridden any other Fireblade. What am I going to say? There's, there's tens of thousands of Fireblade fans going to be reading this. The only thing you can be is is honest. You know, if you feel a certain thing, you just say it. Like you say, everyone's got the same opinion. There's no right or wrong way to review a bike. And the other the other big advantage we've got at MCN is that we're allowed to say what we want about a bike you know you can create so a lot of people ironically think that mcn is in the pocket of manufacturers and we have to say certain things when the opposite is true you know especially back then we were big and bad enough to mm. if honda said well we're not going to advertise you with you anymore because you're giving us a bad review we're just uh, on your way kind of thing whereas yeah. a lot of smaller publications or individuals could never do that or freelancers who want to go on the next launch so i think you know from that day forward with my tests have always just just been honest and I suppose it comes from the experience of being a road rider and having raced before, not at a really high level, but, you know, being able to have your feet in both camps as a racer and a road rider. Mm. That's kind of kept me in good stead all the way through. Yeah. Hello, delivery. Uh, delivery. Uh, you have to go through the other door, mate. We're just... Uh, hang on. <laughs> Should I take the delivery? Yeah. Go find someone down there. Okay. We're just recording up here, so... <coughs> yeah, and yeah, I mean, so, and over the years, I've just just gained gained experience. I've done more and more racing. You know, since two thousand and well, I raced between two, uh, 90, uh, 88 and ninety three, hmm. and then that big accident I had on the road stopped me. So, what, what? Let's go back <coughs> to that accident briefly. Um, so, what happened? It was a. Uh, it was a. It was. I basically rode into the side of a Volkswagen Polo that okay. was turning across me. Yeah. And Did you try and go through the hole in the middle of it? Exactly. Well, I caused the <laughs> hole in the middle of it on, on my RGV 250. Oh. Beautiful bike. And I was in hospital for three months oh, in a wheelchair shit. for a little while. So I just smashed my legs up, basically, and yeah. my wrist and all, all sorts of things. And I dropped foot for about six years afterwards. So I couldn't ride between 94 and 2000. What is drop foot? So it's where... You can't you can't lift your foot up. Yeah, so like a tendon issue. Yes, yeah, so it yeah. was it's actually nerve damage up up near my knee. Okay. So I had to wear a splint in my shoe, so I, I physically couldn't ride. But that started to come back, and um, yeah, then I started riding again in two thousand, and then got the MCN job in two thousand and two. So when I the, the other thing when I started as well, I wasn't really up to the speed I used to be. Mm. So it was kind of a, a gradual gradual start. So so I raced then, and then between. 2004 and now I've raced every single year yeah. so you know and being an instructor at the Ron Haslam Race School so you can kind of use those sensibilities of being able to push a bike and understand what it's doing but also know people's everyday fear about riding a bike you know you talk to a racer they they can't even relate to how people feel because they don't they don't know people are scared to lean into a certain corner or yeah and if you've never leant over a bike as far as you 
inverted commas need to lean it mm. over, you're not going to know where that limit is. No. And the the brave, stupid, whatever you want to call them, people that you know, early on in the track days, they sort of some people are naturally gifted as well. I mean, we'll get onto that in a minute. But mm. if you've never lent a bike over that far, you don't know how how it goes there. What it's going to do? It's causes terrifying. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so racing, racing career. I mean, so you, you've raced every year. Every year, this year is actually the first year I haven't raced. Right. Okay. COVID kind of put us. It kind of stalled it really, and it's never really stalled started everything. Up. Yeah. I mean, we won't get into that this time, but yeah. So yeah, so I've just raced at club level really. I think if I'd have had again a bit more confidence, I would have gone into national level and probably been able to be a mid pack super stock rider or something, something like that. But, but would you have felt satisfied with that though? No, because the other thing is when you're sort of an amateur racer, you're relying a lot on the help of your friends and family. Yeah, and it's incredibly expensive. And really expensive. At the beginning, your friends and family have got a big appetite to help you. But, you know, I think a club racer's career probably never lasts more than three or four years. Mm. Mine's lasted ridiculous amounts because of the job I've got. And I've, I've had really good opportunities and sponsorship. And do you manage to sort of subsidise mm. some of those costs through... Well, I suppose they would still sponsor you privately anyway because yeah. you are... Nothing, none of my racing overtly goes in MCN. No. So all the sponsors I've got is just... And it's the same at any level. I think the, even the, the you know, Paul Bird, bless him, and the, you know, the big sponsors in BSB do it because they enjoy racing. They don't really get anything out of it. It doesn't balance the books, does it? No. And there's, you know, uh, not to... Well, it's very interesting where the money comes from. Mm to go to race to have a race team i mean because you look at it on paper and there ain't no way you're going to make your money back no at all so you either do it passionate for passion um or if you need to lose some money out of your company out yeah. of the books you know without without that stuff I, I don't think and it's i don't think it's limited to motorcycle racing i think it happens you know all all levels of car racing club racing whatever it's Without that, there would be a real <clears throat> hole mm -hmm. in the motor the motor racing scene. Yeah. Um, so we got to support your local drug dealers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Get out there. Get down on the streets. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Not saying they're drug dealers, but there is. You know, of course, it's just like a there, there is a somewhat nefarious dark side to it mm. behind the gloss, the glamour at that level. At definitely. that level. Yeah. And you know, because you can't, you just can't. I can't see how the money works out. Like, why would somebody, <clears throat> any sponsor, give more money to a, put a tiny, a, a mid-range sponsor? And we're not talking, we're not talking high-level brand mm. sponsors. We're talking, oh yeah, I'll put a stick on your bike for yeah, yeah. ten grand for this year. Yeah, that no one's ever really going to see. Let's face it, or, or pay that much attention to when you could sponsor an influencer who you know might might have. Um, 10,000, 100,000 followers and yeah. speaks directly to them and goes, hey, this is actually the product, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, but it's almost how, it's the same way how the journalism industry has evolved and changed and reduced its saturation of money because this other whole digital thing's come along. Mm. It's like, oh. I mean, you still get the old school people who are like, no, we're going to advertise in this and that's the way we've done it for years and that's how it's worked. Yeah. But that that time, if those older companies don't evolve, then they're going to be left behind. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, the racing is quite similar yeah, exactly. in, that, in that respect. It hasn't jumped on the... It hasn't embraced the new technology, whether you like it or not. I mean, I'm, I still don't even know if I like social media. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm I'm kind of I've been prickly about it yeah. throughout the whole thing because there's something underlying which I fundamentally disagree with. Um, however, do the positives outweigh the negatives? Yes, mm. I think they do. Yeah, but there's yeah. some serious issues and uh, concerns for young people's health. You know, these kids sitting on Instagram all day going, "Oh, look at this guy! He's got you know, he's just bought a brand new 916 SPS, and the guy's mm. got everything, and he travels around the world." But the, that's so far from the reality. Yeah. And I try and be pretty honest, but it's so far from the reality of what daily life is. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. With, um, yeah, just going back to the racing. Sorry, yeah. I went off on a tangent there. Well, social, we'll, we'll get back to social media. It's I'm really going to have a biscuit. This is like a uh, goggle box, isn't it, where they have the, the bowl of, of cakes. Have you ever watched that? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a TV anymore. Ah. Well, I have a TV, but I don't have a TV license. 
Right. I refuse to pay the BBC any money. <laughs> I'm done. That's with fair that. enough. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm only able to raise up. The, I've got a handful of, of close friends that, that help me out financially. And they don't get anything out of it other than the enjoyment of being involved. So I've got uh, a friend of mine called Bob who basically looks after my bike. I've got other I've friends. I've seen, seen him on yeah, the bids. Bob, Bob, Bob Stockley. He basically prepares my bikes for me. Um, there's a company called Prime Factors Racing that give me my BMWs to race and a few other sponsors that come along to the race meetings. You know, sometimes we get to race abroad. We've done some really cool endurance racing at uh, Mugello, Aragon, Misano, and they come along. It's like a little holiday event for them. And yeah, that's the dream. Endurance race at Mugello. I mean, I think... Uh, amazing. Uh, what I mean, you know what it's like. I mean, yeah, I, I only ridden it in semi-anger recently <clears throat> this year. Your times are good. It wasn't bad, was yeah. it? It wasn't bad. Um, I mean, I, cr <laughs> I crashed at the end of it. Uh, but that was a, a, a technical fault. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, what, what a circuit. We uh, did the thing called, what was it called? The something milieu, it was 100, no, it couldn't have been 100 miles, 500 miles. But it was. It worked out like a three-hour endurance race. And I was racing there on an S1000RR. And sometimes in endurance racing, you're sort of clock watching a little bit, mm. watching your pit bull, watching the, like Donington's got, got an actual clock. And if you're... If it's a hard race, it drags. But yeah. Mugello, you like when you used never to work on a checkout at Sainsbury's, you know, like, it. it must be four o'clock now. <laughs> exactly. You look and it's ten past one. <laughs> yeah, oh. Exactly. You know, that was just magical the racing at, at Mugello, and we we ended up finishing first in class and third overall against a load of hot shot racers as well. But yeah, so I've had some good times racing. But it's kind of dwindled away a little bit, unfortunately. You know, just through situations. What kind of situation? Well, I think um, we, we were going to do an endurance race this year at Brands Hatch on my S1000 with no limits. But mm. It was oversubscribed. We couldn't get in. It is because uh, we, we were looking at doing mm. um, endurance and no limits is the only way. Well, it's the, it, they, they call themselves the home of endurance racing now, don't they? Because mm. they, they run the, effectively the national yeah, yeah. series. Um, but yeah, you can't get in anywhere. No. I mean, race paddocks are full club race paddocks, and it's and track it's, day paddocks, and it's expensive. So you just yeah. think, well, why can't someone else, another company, go? Mm. Oh, well, we'll we'll do an endurance series as well. I mean, may, who knows? Maybe there's. I some. think the circuit high is so expensive now, isn't it? Yes, uh, and you know, MSV they pretty much own mm. almost every top level circuit in the UK now, don't they? Yeah, exactly. So you kind of it is a bit of a uh, what's the word? Uh, competition monopoly monopoly that's the word yeah um, but you know that's the way things are and yeah, yeah. you got to deal with it haven't you but yeah I'd love to do it and do it well mate we should get it we should do it we should uh, we should do a special one but I'd, I'd much prefer to do it in Spain or somewhere yeah exactly you got sunshine or Italy Italy is the best place to race because they walk around in their dressing gowns in between races with yeah. a little shower you never they see that it. at Cadwell no well, you, races, would you so, want to see it? At no, Cadwell? you wouldn't want to see it at Cadwell. Fe February. What about your racing? Because you did some on the CF Moto, didn't you? Yeah, that was the first time I'd ever got on a grid, and so this was in the Super Twins in two thousand and one, and they were they were looking to to promote their brand. I mean, it's funny, <laughs> CF Moto back then. I was like, who are these people? But two thousand and one. Yeah, two thousand and one. Um, sorry, sorry, two thousand twenty one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 2021 so and and in CF Moto was kind of like who are these people mm. but they you know whatever uh, but now they're in like MotoGP yeah uh, they've just been bought by KTM mm. I think or heavily heavily yeah that's right financed by KTM they're, they're working with Yamaha now um, but anyway so they had this bike to, to to test and Jack Thompson at the time he was um, their marketing guy he's a competent racer himself uh, and he was like, well, we'll give you a bike. Well, we'll run a bike for you if you want to enter it and just do a, do a vid. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a crack. And uh, I didn't expect anything of it, to be honest. Mm. I was just sort of like, well, I'll see what it's like and didn't really take it that seriously. Uh, first round Donington Park, the bike was, was not ready, to put it nicely. Um, not that I would really know what a race bike really was. And I was interested in that as well because you get give it like you get, here's a, here's a, a top spec bike. Someone's mm -hmm. put some Olin suspension <clears throat> in it. Doesn't make it a race bike, does it? No. You know, it's they they are fine tuned um, 
tiny window of of perfection and outside of that window it's really difficult to ride yeah and a wit like people who just sort of you know the sofa racers they'll never understand that it's like oh well, my mate's got fire blade it's well fast come on it's like yeah but you never it, that can be down to a tire pressure as we're seeing a motor gp now yeah, exactly. i mean ridiculous isn't it but anyway so um so i was interested in the whole thing i thought yeah cool i'll give it a go and um yeah I, I really quite enjoyed it. Did you it. get the bug? I, I did. I did. But I think the worst thing I did was put it on pole position at Cadwell Park. <laughs> because you then, it's a whole weekend racing. So that, I think qualifying was on the Friday. And it was the end of the set, end of the day, Friday. So then you've got to go to bed thinking, fucking hell. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm on it here. I'm on it. I've got to get my first, could get my first win here. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm and it's going through your head. What am I going to do off the start? And I know it's only club racing a uh, twin, but it doesn't matter. You, nice. The adrenaline is still yeah, yeah. there. And everyone else in that, yeah, there's a few, you know, people at the back that are just hanging out just because they want to go and ride their bike. But it's a competitive, mm. you know, it's a, it's a battle. It's hard work. So then you're like trying to think of a plan. And of course, anyway, woke up, raining, piss wet. Never, never done a lap of Cadwell in the rain. I had only probably done about three laps of Cadwell prior to that. Anyway, it wasn't. It's so far away from me. I didn't tend yeah. to go up there very much. And I, I've done very few UK circuits. I've done way more abroad stuff. Uh, so anyway, yeah, sort of, yeah, started and um, fell off at Park Corner. I think. I think <laughs> I made it halfway around. Um, but no, it, 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 and then I beat myself up about it. And then mm. you get sort of like, and, I'm, and I think. I do have the bug for racing and I like it and I think I I have a I'm all right at it. I think there's a natural ability that's underlying there. Mm -hmm. But I'm 45 years old now. I've just started doing it. It's kind of if you'd have started when you're 15, yeah, maybe exactly. you might, you know, get there. So so yeah, I'm too competitive and I'd beat myself up about it and um it would become not fun. And and it strikes me that you, this is why I think you still can do it because your mentality is so good. I've never seen you get flustered. I've never seen you, if you do, you hide it very well. I've never yeah. seen you get angry. I've never seen you lash out or make the wrong decision. It's calm. You're a very calm person to be around, actually. And it's very, you know, uh, it's easy to be in your company. Mm, and, right. and I think that that mentality helps an awful lot. And if you're having a, like, if, if for some reason your bike's not working, mm. You'll just go, well, the bike's not that good this round. Let's get through it. And uh, we'll try yeah. again for the next one. Like yeah, positive. Exactly. Whereas yeah. mine's like, bike's not working. Push it harder. Push it harder. Fall off. Yeah. But it sounds like your weekend was full of excitement. Did you have many nerves? Yeah. I mean, it's it scared the shit. It's scared. Yeah, it's, I'm really nervous. It is race. very scary. Like, get, get, pulling out onto the grid. Like, you're looking at the clock. Ten minutes, you know, five mm. minutes, right, helmet on. Warm the bike up, get it down, paddock. Like we've got everything, you know. Yeah. Queuing up with everyone. Once the light goes out, it's all right. But that yeah. that sort of sighting lap and and sitting on that grid, waiting for the red flag. What's going on? I know. It's just like... it, and it is yeah, scary. Yeah. Um, will I launch it? Will I stall it? Will I get hit from behind? You know, there's a lot of yeah, exactly danger. But it's the thrill is is <clears throat> close to unbeatable. Um, doesn't matter what you're riding you could all be on one two fives mm. that you just bought from the shop down there not even race bikes the thrill is and just to finish yeah. no matter where you are you've taken a checkered flag that feeling of elation and relief and all those kind of things and that lasts about 15 minutes and it starts mm. yeah and then you start the getting nervous session. for the next one yeah 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 but i did all right i did I, yeah, a couple of podiums a couple well, of seconds good. but the car the field was very strange because in the Super Twins, as you know, there, there'd be a lot of people pre-TT season would turn mm. up with these ridiculous, yeah, like yeah. 80 grand Daffabet type, you know, proper production bikes. You know, the, I don't think the, the Twins class was supposed to be quite so uh, expensive. Mm. But with the, the Farquhars and all of this stuff, building these amazing, yeah, exactly. they are amazing bikes, let's face it, amazing bikes. And they would turn up and just sort of rinse the field and then not be at the next round so you yeah. were if you got a podium you were lucky that the good bikes didn't yeah, turn exactly. up yeah. so you'd kind of look at the entrance list and go shit but yeah that's a good good result when i when i first started i was hopeless it was it was a typical story of riding on the road i had a gsxr 750j in 1988 when i was 18 
and thought I was Schwantz. Yeah. Because I could perfect his crossed up Schwantz okay. wheelies. Right, okay, yeah. And I uh, thought oh, I'll have a go racing. And I remember going to Brands Hatch. And in practice, just getting absolutely rinsed by everybody. Just thinking, because you have to go around corners fast on the track, don't you? You mm. don't have to do that on the road. And actually broke my foot in practice. That was my first. I'd never even made my first race. And then uh, after that, I raced uh, an RGV 250 for a couple of years in 250 Proddy racing. Again, wasn't brilliant. But then when it rained, I'd be podium or winning. And I thought, well, there's obviously something here. Mm. And then just got better in the dry as well. And uh, I suppose that my peak racing would have been 2011 to 17, maybe. I won a championship and, you know, finished On the top before. I did uh, race a two, uh, uh, some kind of S1000RR since um, 2010. HB4 mm. was 2014. Mm. I finished, uh, I won the MRO championship in 2012 and finished top three in the GP1 Thundersport in a couple of years after that. But yeah, it's a shame it's fizzled out a little bit. But now if I go on a grid with a superbike and you're surrounded by 20, 30-year-olds who want to be Marquez, I haven't got that hunger anymore. So I quite like uh, the idea of in, uh, classic racing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually building, um, I'm not doing it because I'm useless, but uh, Griff at AP Workshops. Right. So a pretty specialist, Griff Willie up there. He's, um, we're, we're building like a, a project bike about of, of, out of an old RSV Milli R. Ah, which is probably one of the best value super bikes yeah. you can buy. I mean, you can still pick a, an R model up for three and a half grand, a bit of a tattoo one. Comes with Olin's forks, yeah. Olin's shot, uh, OZ wheels, carbon fiber, Italian V twin. Wow. Rotax 990 engine, very solid. Yeah. Amazing things to ride, like really engaging. Like if you want an engaging ride that, that isn't as expensive as a 916. Yeah. Go and get one of them. And a lot of knowledge on that bike because there used to be a one make race series for it, didn't there? So people know what makes them tick. I know there was a Tuono cup, wasn't there? Mm, there was an RS, there was a Millet right, thing as it? well. Yeah. Yeah, sort of 2003 or four, right, something okay. like that. Yeah. I so mean, again, that was before I'd even paid attention to it. I was going to say, so you started riding in 2008, did you? Yeah, road riding. What made you start? Um, I, I crashed, I had a car crash, weirdly. Well, actually, just rewind, just before that. So I, I had, my brother was well into his wanky scooters. So his right. um, mods type, oh, those, you know, yep. the, the uh, Molossi kitted mm -hmm. Lambrettas and Vespers and stuff. So uh, his mate, he was mates with some guy that built them. And we were like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a, yeah, go on, kiss one of those. Let's build one. And I just really wanted to sort of put it in the office on, on display like a cool thing. Uh, in my Soho office. Oh yes. And uh, yeah, oh great, bloody bloody got a bloody Vespa. <laughs> and um, anyway, it's bright, painted it bright Lamborghini orange. This with like a really cool graphics on the side. And but because we wanted to put a, I think it was a 180 kit or a 170 kit in it or something, you needed a full license to drive to ride it. So I'd, that process had started, mm. uh, and I just passed my test. And but I wasn't I wasn't planning on being a motorcyclist. And then I had a big crash in a brand new 2008 BMW M3, um, which I'd, I'd, I'd sold some shares in a business. And I was like, oh, God, treat yourself. You have yeah, to yeah. get this thing. It was that the first of the E92, right. was it? The V8. Yeah. And it was the first convertible. Oh, wow. And it was, it was a cancelled order. And there was, there was hardly any around anyway. I was like, yeah, have it. And then uh, I took my girlfriend at the time, who turned into my wife, uh, on a driving holiday through France, and doing like and my beautiful new car and everything yeah. was brilliant. What colour? It was carbon black, oh, although it didn't have the shadow line uh, kit, which was it still had the chrome window, right. which made it look a bit crap anyway. <laughs> uh, but I, I remember, <laughs> I remember we stayed in a campsite on the first night, um, and uh, it was it was such a strange thing. We, we stayed in this campsite and uh, a. Not only with these French guys who love their motorsport as well, they're like, oh, yeah, M toi, M toi, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it's cool, yeah, so, yeah, give it a rev. And um, but a bird, I woke up in the morning and a bird had shit on the rear quarter. I was like, oh, fucking bird shit. And I had a napkin with me and I started cleaning it off, but badly. And I scratched like a tiny oh, no. little, not even a yeah. scratch, but just like a. Uh, and I was like, oh, bloody, uh, scratch the thing. Anyway, three hours later, 
um, we pulled over for a coffee in the middle of nowhere, heading down to Annecy, and uh, got back in the car, roof down, let's go the back way into town, we'll take some nice roads, pulled out, wrong side of the road. And just wasn't aware of it, because I was in my car, right-hand drive vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, Katie, my wife, at the, well, girlfriend at the time, we were just, you know, music on, just no other cars around. So you, you no, if there's no, that's often no what signs, triggers yeah. you. I'm sure you've yeah. done it. We've all sort of gone, oh shit. Yeah. But it's only when you see another car or a sign and you go, oh, wow, I'm on the wrong side. And it, we must've been driving for a good two or three minutes because there was not a lot of traffic around. And then anyway, just went around this corner and then all of a sudden, what's that? And just plowed straight into this VW no. Polo. Yeah, no, absolutely. Polo? Yeah, a Polo. Huh. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Bloody things everywhere, Bloody aren't they? Know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was... Well, head on. Head on, absolutely, absolutely rinsed it. I, I wasn't, we weren't speeding, we were just cruising. It wasn't like a... Yeah. But a closey speed's still pretty tasty. Oh, if you're both doing 50 mile an hour, you, yeah. you scrub 20 off for the brakes, but it's a good 80 mile an yeah. hour, you know, and, and, and the Polo, I mean, pfft, you know, this was a big V8, brand yeah. new car. This was, and the other one was a small little sort of... Yeah. Uh, Anyway, and then, uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty traumatic experience for me, actually. I I'm still feel very affected by it. It's yeah. a, it's a, I've got this, like, a guilt complex, which I'm sure a lot of the sort of depression and anxiety probably fed from some of that, mm -hmm. um, which we can talk about later. But, um, yeah, so I hit, the, uh, hit this car. Anyway, sort of like, whoa, whoa no. got out, had two broken ankles, didn't know it at the time, but sort of like, you yeah, know. Yeah, the adrenaline's you, pumping, isn't it? And, you know, got out, saw this other car there and uh, couldn't see anyone in the driver's seat. So I sort of walked up to it and this poor kid was just like sort of doubled down, like bent over in the footwell, just pissing blood and just oh, like, wow. poof, poof, like, like, and I was like, oh my God, like his head had hit the windscreen. He wasn't wearing a seatbelt, um, but, you know, regard, I was like, he's, he's gone. Yeah. So I, I, I thought, I genuinely thought I'd killed him for three days wow. in this hospital in, in Annecy. And I remember really, very, very clearly, it was the 2008 Olympics on telly. Yeah. And I was just sat in this hospital and, uh, oh God, it was so traumatic thinking, I'd, I was just in tears. Like, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I remember just thinking, don't care about the car, couldn't give a shit, just please, please, mm. I don't want to, like, and even if it, he, he was, you know, dead, I'd be like, well, send me to prison. Yeah. I'm done. And on wow. the third day, because and again, any nurse that came in, I was like, How, "How's the other guy? How's the other?" Guy? And they'd be like, "Oh, I don't know." And on, I asked the ambulance driver on the side of the road, like who had attended to Katie. She she was all right, but like bashed up leg and stuff. Um, I was like, "How's the other guy?" And he sort of looked at me and did a sort of fifty fifty with his hand, and I was like, "Christ!" So and then I remember being put in a separate trolley thing in the hospital, and I heard this woman wailing in the in the reception. I was like, "That's his mum." Yeah, oh my God. yeah. And, and uh, but anyway, on the third day, saw him outside smoking a fag. So, how uh, relieved! And 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 yeah, that, and that was it. That was like the the gendarme had taken our passports, and you know, so I got you know went down there, had a conversation. What happened? And he was just like, it happens all the time. Really, it happens all the time. But I think uh, he interestingly, so he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Um, and it was apparently his mum's car. This is a, all you know what I can. Bad French English yeah, translation, yeah, yeah. but what I sort of understood, uh, and I th it was a Sunday in France, and I think he might have had a couple of drinks in him as well. So it kind of got resolved as go away, mm -hmm. he's going to go away, and there's nothing more of it. Never even got a claim from the insurance company. Wow, nothing. So I'm surprised. I'm not surprised it's been, that's been with you all this time. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and actually, interestingly, I was in Annecy. Um, where did we go? Yeah, I drove down. That went on. Went to Mugello, and oh. I drove past the crash site. Did stopped you? and had a little bit of a, a moment. A bit of a moment mm. to sort of calibrate. Wow. And um, and actually, <laughs> and off camera, we were talking about the car that I wrote off, which was my M3. Yeah. And the insurance company, amazingly, I bought Gap Insurance. Didn't even know I had it. It was three hundred quid. Mm -hmm. But when the payout came, it was they offered me like fifteen grand less for the car. Um, and that's where I said I swore I'll never buy another brand new car. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Gap Insurance covered it, <clears throat> and then I went and bought the 911 Turbo out of, out nice. of the back of that. Um, but before the 911 Turbo, yeah, sorry, so this is how I got into bikes. I, I went through a period of probably about 
three or four months while the insurance was going through of feeling so bad and guilty that I was like, I think I'm going to ride a motorbike because I can't hurt anyone mm. as badly. Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, it, it, so I, I suppose thinking about it, that, that, that trauma led me yeah. to motorcycles. And uh, yeah, it still gets me going today, mate, honestly. I can imagine. Poor, horrible, horrible experience. Um, but yeah, so that's what got me into motorbikes. And I had a, a six, 600N Bandit. Right. Blue, blue one. Uh, very much like the Alpine budget bike, battle bike we had. Yeah. Uh, and I, that was it. I got the bug. As soon as you go off above a 125 or a 170, whatever, scooter, and you, you do that first pull onto a slip road, even on a 500cc old heavy bike, they are fast, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, like, exactly. You get that, like, what the hell is that? Yeah. And then that was it. And then I bought a CBR 600RR. <laughs> and then, so you didn't and go then, ever have a moped? No, only that little thing. Because wow. I, t- I was 30. 29 yeah, yeah. so I, I, did, I just did a direct access so I didn't have wow. to go through that that phase and then yeah, yeah. within a year I was on a Repsol Fireblade no yeah and were you into bike racing did you watch no. the GPs uh, I, when I the Repsol yeah I, I did um, yeah I got I was I did like the look of the bikes but I wasn't technically clued up at all so before before you started noticing bikes there was no I, I can tell you I, I noticed, I tell, I tell you the first time I did notice a bike before I'd ridden um, and before I passed my test is I was uh, heading, driving through Weybridge area, I used to live in Weybridge, and uh, there was two bikes flying towards me and one, and I remember the, the headlights very clearly, one was what turned out to be a VTR SP2 Honda RC51 and the other one was a ZX7R, bright green, pure white, Mm. And I just thought, wow, they are they are they are awesome. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and now I'm lucky enough to be able to own both of those bikes that I not the exact ones, um, but yeah, a, a SP2 VTR and a Zenit Seven R. It was just like that, that. Just they just looked so so mean. So every time I look at them, I'm like I remember that time. Yeah, exactly. Driving down the road and seeing wow. it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what now we're you, now do, we're do, in a situation. So our journey through biking is quite different, isn't it? Yeah. But we're almost at the similar places now because you're, you've got a YouTube channel that's yeah. almost on par subscribers-wise with the MCN channel. We're both, we're both kind of in the same kind of place, video land, aren't we? And we've got yeah. into it in a completely different way. Yeah. And, and I, think, I, think that makes, I think that makes for better understanding of, uh, of what people want, I guess. And it makes a more interesting and diverse mm. community of where people – you don't want – 200 people to be turning up from the same place because guess what? The content will be the same because they've yeah. been taught the same, they've learnt the same and they've dealt with the same scenario. So I think um, I think it's good. And I think uh, if there's one thing that I'm quite proud of, I guess, it's when, when I met Al from 44 Teeth who was at the time working for Fast Bikes and we just did a couple of silly interviews of, you know, yeah. Baron Von Grumble, you know, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And then we ended up going down to Portimao for one of their Superbike of the year test That's sports yeah. spot, spotties they used to call them where I met Gary Hartshorn for the first time Bridgestone Gary and um, a love bloomed there <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah so that, that was a, that was a great trip and, and got chatting and then we 44 Teeth was born out of the sale of fast bikes uh, to Morton's I think yeah and Al didn't want to go and, and do that so we're like well let's try something uh, and again his traditional to a point journalistic mm. background because he started a similar time to me and i think he also won his job at fast Bikes, right okay but in a less uh, formal way yeah i think they were going to start a competition but maybe didn't go through it as, as deeply as we do did. you think they saw how you how mcn did maybe it? We'll, we'll yeah do, we'll do and i think thing. al joined in a similar way yes yeah i think maybe a year or two behind me so we've been we've kind of grown up together as well so it's interesting to see his journey and how he's ended up yeah, it's it, it's it's kind of like a uh, there's there's a what do they call that point where everything sort of comes to a, like a convergence mm. or something. I, I think it's all being dragged one way or another to, to this yeah, point yeah. where you have to consider all of these options. But but yeah, so so then so forty four teeth was born out of that kind of thing, and uh, I definitely feel that we were part of an industry change, mm. and I think. Through, through luck or judgment or whatever, and just reading the signs of what was happening, we had this perfect blend of blogging, 
this whole new era yeah and traditional journalism to help with the brands and the and the manufacturers because you've got to get in with the manufacturers i mean now, now it's it's easier if, if you've got a big following to be honest you can probably just ring up whoever mm. and go yeah i'm so and so can i borrow a bike yeah. and i'll probably say yes yeah exactly um but at that time we had nothing so and it was like you're a what you're you're an influencer you, you well in fact the term influencer didn't even exist no, when yeah. i started it was uh, you're a vlog a vlogger yeah a vlogger a, a vlogger <laughs> and uh and anyway we we yeah we 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 were, we were lucky enough to to create what we created in 44 teeth which was this blend which feels like the traditional magazines have now been trying to play catch up for mm. the last six or seven years to create what we had or what we what we started um and now this is that that seems to be where we're at you need a you need a degree of professionalism and industry uh knowledge yeah to be respected enough i mean look sure there's a load of uh influencers out there who have got massive numbers but let's face it don't really know that much about mm. how to ride a bike industry you know, stuff how how yeah. things work they've just got a massive following which absolutely fine by me doesn't bother me um but i think you've got to get that magic window it's like yeah. the operational window of a race bike yeah exactly you know you, you've, it's it's a very difficult thing to tiptoe around and keep the the the, the fans happy with the slightly renegade approach to things but not go too far that the manufacturers go we've got to disassociate yeah, ourselves with exactly. this because there's That's so the much fear now mm. uh, and this cancel culture mm. we're in that it's 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 put 44 teeth in quite a difficult position i mm. mean we could have over the years made a lot more money and a lot more growth by being more acceptable yeah but it's not what we wanted and this mm. is why i have this sort of prickly relationship with everything because i'm like well that's not how people talk it's mm. not how the reality of blokes down a bike cafe no, talk exactly. about yeah shit so uh but yeah i'm quite proud of i think how we at least instigated that change in the industry which i think is for better yeah absolutely um, so was there a time before you met al when you were doing your vlogs that you kind of wanted to enter the media world the motorcycle media world, no. or was it complete accident no. by chance you met how and the ideas yeah floated? yeah no complete because I, I that's what i wanted to do more than anything and that's why i'm still doing it now because it's my dream job no i was quite i, I think i was quite uh arrogant about the whole thing actually a, a guy who used to work with me called ollie he had a ollie 333 was his youtube channel and he said Chris, you got to start. You got you got to do this this blogging thing. We put it on YouTube and make videos. I was like, you what? Mm. Sharp. Like <laughs> what, what? What a loser! And I'm not doing that. And um, it it felt. I, I eventually started doing it because I kept getting sort of. I was bored of travelling in and out. I had like an hour and twenty minute commute each day on the bike. All weathers on my gorgeous GSXR yeah. thousand. Bless yeah, it. Yeah. And um, it was boring. And you almost I almost wore a camera to regulate don't speed you got a camera on you don't want to get pulled over and busted wow. and blah, blah, blah. anyway so i thought i'll just do this thing and I, I had a very cavalier don't give a shit attitude which was opposite to the the bloggers that were in that field a lot of them anyway because they i think they did care quite a lot and i think i had this accidental cavalier yeah yeah i had a great job i was earning loads of money i, I was had a production company in soho i don't really need it so I didn't even really um, talk that much about motorcycles. In fact, in fact, most bloggers didn't talk anything about motorcycles, yeah. motor vloggers. Yeah, they yeah. just talked about life. And yeah. that's what I really, really liked. I liked the communication and talking about problems, whether it's or, or, or silly things that happened. You know, I, I remember one video called Alcohol Induced Knob Chat, <laughs> which was just a, a discussion about these weird Scandinavian axe throwers that I met <laughs> the night before. And yeah. uh, we were talking about shower or grower, you know. Yeah. But they call it a sports cock or a blood cock <laughs> and stuff like that. And and that that to me was entertainment. And the fact yeah. that I was riding a bike was cool, but it wasn't a bike review. No. And I always resisted. It, I found it's it's so e compared to having entertaining and engaging conversations like that. I find it so easy to go and knock a bike review out. It's boring. Hmm. So actually, 
the answer is probably no. I don't particularly like doing bike reviews. Um, I prefer the entertainment side yeah. of things, I think. And that comes through in the videos, isn't it? I, I think so. It's an entertainment channel, isn't it? Yeah. First and foremost. Yeah, I mean, if I'm struggling for content, it's it's so easy to go, I'll just go and do a bike review on this. Because mm. it's easy. You've got a format to follow. Yeah. How does it ride? How does it feel? How much is it? What does it do? What category is it in? You can you can follow a formula, mm. which is why there's so many channels out there which do that very same thing, because it's pretty easy. Yeah. But if you want to step it up to really entertain people enough for them to come out of their way to buy a cinema ticket to yeah. go and watch you cocking around on on the big screen and you know travel 200 miles, that's an achievement. Yeah. And that, I, that I'm more proud of than any bike review that we've done. Did you ever envisage you'd be <laughs> have your stuff on a big screen no so last year was the first year of doing this wasn't it yeah um and it was it, it, it's the best thing we've done financially and for enjoyment it ticks all the boxes yeah. um it's not easy to make money on youtube as i'm sure you're probably yeah finding out um but it's handy for a bit of pocket money to help tide you over um and again from I, I, in recent years, my my production company, Dead Pixels, which I, I ran for quite a long, it's still going. I still do occasional jobs, but it went from having six or seven staff in Soho to now having a little unit mm. with no staff, just freelancers, as as and when, full of motorbikes. And with that's come a massive pay cut, like massive. Yeah. But you've got to ask yourself the question: What's making you happier? And at this point in my life, it's motorcycles. Mm. And I've got to stop feeling guilty about not abandoning that side of my life because I think it's helped creatively. I used to direct TV commercials, done a load of like motion graphics and stuff and yep. produce video and animated content, which is why I think, which, which shows in the, the videos that we make, it's got a different sort of feel to it. And, I, and so without that previous life, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, exactly. So I can't discount it, but... Um, yeah, it's that to to, get, to then now be seeing the light that there is a financial avenue mm. to to go to actually make. And I'm not I, like I don't care if I don't end up being a millionaire, but it it'd be nice to to be paid a, yeah enough, you know. And now you can go okay. Well, actually, it could work. And it's not the, the cinema. The best thing about it is completely separate to sucking a brand's dick to go hey. We want to advertise your product. It's irrelevant. Yeah. It's a direct contact yeah. between you and the fans. And YouTube's irrelevant as well because you don't have to play by their rules and their silly games that they yeah. play. Oh, you can't say that. You can't question that. You can't do that. You've got to do this. You've got to make it safe. You've got to make it that. Also, they can sell advertisements on the back of your videos. Mm. Um, so you don't have to play the algorithm game either. We've done the hard work in creating a fan base which is so loyal which is incredible yeah. that they want to come and see us. And uh, so you, you've got a direct relationship with them. They pay you directly. It works well. And we're going to have a good time. We do Q&As and it's not just the film. Yeah, like, yeah. That's one thing, the, the making the film. But it's it's a brilliant laugh. You yeah. should come. Well, well, there's, there is one in, we were going to do Peterborough, but they don't have an Odeon. I think there's, how far are you from Norwich? Uh, not far, nowhere as far, too far, Hull, is it? Hull? There's one in Hull. It's near Chad, that one. Is it? Oh, don't go to that one. <laughs> I'll definitely come along. But how have you seen YouTube change since you started? You say it's changed a lot. Yeah, wild. I mean, I think uh, it'd be interesting to see what the date of the first video I put up with, but it was probably 2011. Right. So we're probably 12 going on 13 years into it. And it was a wild west of anything goes, which was... Very appealing, actually, because we were still in the the, th the controls of television media, mm -hmm. and then suddenly this, hey, you can do what you want, so, like you can be who you want to be, and in fact, the the very name YouTube was putting you right on the telly, yeah, and it was this like, wow, this whole new thing, um, and it seemed that the videos you put out back then they didn't have like nowadays, you put a video out and it peaks day one and then just flatlines, yeah, and that's it. You don't seem to get any, unless it's a particular thing that you might have stumbled into this mm -hmm. window, this tiny performance window where one or two videos will just keep going. But most of them hit this thing, peak, turn off. And I'm, I'm, 
I don't know the ins and outs of it. It's a dark mystery. I don't think anyone really does. But you, it's a concern these days, whereas before it wasn't. You'd put mm. a video out, and if it was good, it would get watched. Yeah. Would you make decent money off of it at the beginning? No. The money is better now. Right. Like, without a doubt. But the hoops you have to jump through mm. to get that money ends up affecting your content because you end up shaping it yeah. to be commercial which ends up being like quite a down dry. version of what you yeah, wanted. Yeah, uh, quite dry and, and nothing's going to... You can't change the world on YouTube anymore. No. Um, and that is completely counter to what it. I thought it was. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you mean I can I can help... Not that I want to tell people what to do or educate them. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to put words into people's mouths or minds, but you felt like you could make a bit of a difference, whereas... Mm -hmm. Any off-topic, po off slightly controversy, or even just doing those touring videos, like the, yeah. the Permission to Talk stuff, you can see algorithmically that YouTube's just not interested. And because it can't, I think it's because it can't sell stuff against mm. it. It's difficult to sell stuff. You know, as you know, when you, you upload a video now, you have to sign a, a, a submit ratings and yep. all of this stuff. Oh, no, it doesn't contain any of this. Mm. So make sure it's safe for advertisers. And I think if you did a exhaust review or a motorcycle review even, that's likely to be better up there, particularly if you're not riding it. Mm -hmm. Because again, for some reason, YouTube doesn't particularly like... Well, you got a video pulled from the Triumph Speed Triple 1200RR yeah. launch for yeah. something that wasn't dangerous. Well, uh, we'd, we'd, ex we'd much prefer to take it being pulled. We got uh, like a black flag. We got really? a, We got a... Uh, an absolute fingering for that yeah on the same level uh, it was like categorized as dangerous incitement or something no yeah, yeah. Uh, it's on the same level they've they categorized it as uh uh on par with explaining how to make an explosive device like an ied Bloody hell. and you're like hang on and all it was was boo the overtook not on a solid white or anything that's right well, we're in a all in a you're train in a together line. yeah, yeah. We weren't doing anything wrong. And who? And, and this is the bit that absolutely terrifies me because who made that decision? What happened? Fair enough if it was like a competitor that was like, I hate these guys, I'm just going to complain yeah. about everything, which I'm sure we get. But we, but we we didn't even know for a month what it was that caused that community guideline strike. It's a big deal. And can you talk to them or are they impossible to get hold impossible of? Impossible to get hold of. Hmm. After, after trying... I think six weeks later, we got a time code of what the problem was. Because I was like, was it something Boothie said? Yeah. Was it, you know, what, what, what the hell was this? Um, yeah, and then we eventually got a time code. And we're like, it's an overtake. And the car coming towards didn't flash or anything. No. It wasn't even like a, oh, that was close or anything. So it's terrifying that there is that control uh, aspect. And I've known other creatives that have had uh, time taken out of their videos. Wow. cut like sections of a video without YouTube even telling them shortening it to get rid of certain things wow and that is That's scary isn't it just scary but but we're, we're here we're all conforming because mm. we all want to be a successful YouTuber yeah yeah um, so it, this is my prickly predicament because it enables me to do this and talk and put alternative uh, points of view out there I guess but also you still have to tickle the balls of the main man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and it's just it's distasteful. Yeah. So you're going to carry on with the YouTube stuff. Yeah. 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 I, but I'm just going to carry on and do whatever shit yeah. I want. And But it's almost a launch pad for you to do other things now. Yeah. I think so. And this podcast, you know, I don't know where this is going to go. I don't mm. know what's going to happen. But you know, why I've got loads of other difficult stuff in my life. Why not add another one? Yeah, in exactly. Yeah, make the day go faster, didn't it? Yeah. So, what's what's the fundamental difference between the things you do for Forty Four Teeth and for your own channel and your own social media? Um, I guess I stopped. Um, I pretty much stopped doing all pretty much all BVG stuff when Forty Four Teeth started getting a bit of a run. Mm -hmm. Um. For numerous reasons, not out of purpose, but the time to do that and run the day job at the time and do my own yeah. stuff. It was like, let's just focus on this and you know, and get it done. But I think 
I don't, to be honest, I don't know what the difference is mm. going to be. It's kind of, I, I do feel like I'm at this point in my life now where I kind of need to shit or get off the pot. And, yeah. and f I, I'm desperate for a direction that is, is more clear and positive. But I'm, again, amazingly fortunate enough to have a lot of strings in my bow and all of the, this fork in the road, all of the paths are pretty good. Yeah. You know, I could go, I could focus on that one and that would be amazing or focus on that one. But one thing I've definitely learned, you can't focus on no, all. No, that's right. So th th there is going to come a, a time. I mean, we're actually talking about, um, with another friend of mine, Rixy, Jimmy Fetter, mm -hmm. uh, he, he does some stuff for us. Uh, and we're, gonna, we're looking at setting up an agency type deal, um, world exclusive, uh, mm -hmm. where I, I think from the knowledge we have of the industry and of motorcycles and the respect that we have out there, it just seems like a natural step because we've worked with so many brands that sadly don't have it. Like they, they ha they're tied into, oh, sorry, we can't do that because the agency, we're, we've tied yeah, into yeah. this agency. And the agency's got no idea about even how to take a photograph of a motorcycle. I'm, we've, I'm sure you've been on a launch where you've got a photographer, clinically an excellent yeah. photographer skill, but the bike looks... If they don't know bikes. Then, if they don't know bikes, yeah. then they're just going to take a picture which you're, you're going to go, oh, look, shit yeah, there, I'm not yeah. going to put that up. But the bike looks amazing. Mm. Yeah, it does look amazing. Yeah. But I'm not going to put that up because it looks shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I look like I'm a, you know, a duffer, you know, outlap, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so I think that's an, a, a, a longer term natural progression for me to start doing that because I don't want to be Jeremy Clarkson's age still slogging it around. Fair enough, if, if I earn as much money yeah, as exactly. I probably will. Yeah. But it, this is motorbikes, so you've got to turn it down a bit. It just it feels like, you know, you, you, I've got to, the businesses that I'm involved in, there's got to be a way of, of not being a key man in all of them. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to be able to go, hang on, well, actually we, we could start this company which then um, uh, operates on a, a more staff basis. So, it's, so if in 10 years time I go, do you know what? I want to go and buy an island now, I'm fat enough. You can sell your businesses yeah. because nobody's going to buy a business <clears throat> that, Nobody's going to buy the Baron von Grumble channel, for example. because no, it's you. It, yeah, exactly. Mm. So, so I think that channel, this one that we're on now, will always be here, a piece of me, mm. deciding whatever I want to do at the time is right to do. Yeah. So however I evolve, that's going to be there. Whereas the other stuff, like the, the 44 teeth or uh, whatever, bike sausage, which is another thing yeah, we've got yeah, going. That's right, yeah. All these other little things, that they need a cohesive um, structure. So uh, who knows what's going what, what, what's to come of that. But ultimately, we've done the hard work, which is getting the audience yeah. and, and doing that. And, we, we, and how long has it been now? Almost 10 years is now, it? which is wow. kind of criminal, actually, that we're still at 300,000 subscribers. I think we should be way above that. Yeah, yeah. But it, again, it's because we haven't taken this next leap of we need people to help us do this because you can't do everything. You can't. No. Me and Al can't shoot the video edit the video, be in the video, uh, manage our emails, do our tax return. That is just... It's so time consuming. Just it, editing. Hours and hours and hours. Well, and it just flies by. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm in the... I've just started doing... We, we, were, we were looking at getting an editor to do Budget by Battle 7 for us. But uh, it's just going to be too much of a task. If you weren't on the, the mm. job, it's very difficult yeah, to exactly. see what, what it was. So. And giving someone his instructions is as time consuming is actually doing it isn't it yeah and uh so i've just started laying that out now so that's going to be two months probably so do you work together in front of a computer doing that uh or i'm, do you, you I'm do doing a bit, he does a bit yeah depending on what other <clears throat> roles we've got to do yeah. yeah yeah so and and what's your what's your plan then because your your channel um Neavesy bikes youtube uh i really like it thanks mate i think i think what you've sort of stumbled into there and then we had a chat off camera of, of uh, how you stumbled into it. Is a is a again a, a really nice little that performance window mm. of to the point. As I said, you're very calming and easy to watch. And I think that that's why a lot of people can just go, oh, you know, I'm going to put the kettle on and just have that going there. You don't necessarily have to watch it either. No, that's the other good thing. You can yeah. just sort of sit there and, and have it going <clears throat> in the background, and it and it helps people who like bikes and yeah. So I think what's your plan? Well, stumbling into it is the, the right term because I've been, I think I've had my channel going since about 2012. 
and predominantly to produce racing blogs for when I was racing. Yeah. As a little bit of a thank you to sponsors and just it never really got any views. Then I started doing every year uh, a road tester's diary. And it was kind of, I remember on that first uh, Z1000 launch that I did, I was with a Kawasaki PR guy. And he said, oh, I always take pictures of, you know, the, the launch so I can remember, you know, remember. And that sort of stuck with me. And I, I take video clips of every job I go on, even if it's a little road test down the road. And at the end of the year, I collate all the little, like my own diary. Mm -hmm. And I used to put my own favorite music that meant the most to me that year on it. Yep. So it was, the channel was never monetized. I just used to do it as a bit of fun. And then last year, I decided to do a little uh, uh, um, video on how I got the job because it was a 20, my 20-year 20 anniversary. And it got a lot of views and a lot of interest. And I suddenly thought, because in, in MCN, I'm, I'm kind of in a bubble where I don't, I'm just... I'm just in this road test, brilliant bubble. Mm. But I don't really sort of have any interaction with anybody else, any readers or anything. The only interaction I get is the comments on our videos where they're not necessarily that kind with MCN because people are, no. when it comes to a big organisation or a company like, or a football team, people are, can be quite vitriolic towards you. But if yeah. it's an individual, then they're not. They're generally quite kind, as I'm sure they are. Because 44 Teeth is, is you and Al. Yes, but it's also, and I think this was a negative as well, it's also still seen as a company. Mm. So you have the negative of that. Like, like this is why big companies need influencers and individuals to help grow their perception. Because yeah. a, a company's never, in my opinion, a, a duo or a trio or whatever, is never going to have as many dedicated followers as an individual yeah. person. Exactly. Um, let me just, this is about to run out of battery, and I just want to, I'm just going to stop recording and then start. Are we going again? Yeah, well, we'll just go to that battery runs out. There's one divil left, but it's probably going to be about 10 minutes or something, and then we'll go and have a pee break and see, what, see where <clears> we're at. So with them, um, yeah, so I did this video explaining how I, how I got my job. got a lot of views and I really a lot of positive com um, comments. And it kind of made me realise that, you know, I've been riding bikes for professionally for 20-odd years. I've probably ridden every new bike since 1990. I've got all this knowledge and experience with motorcycles and the industry that I never really talk about. You know, it's there subconsciously. Every time I do a road test, I draw on that experience, but I never actually talk about it with anyone. So I decided to make a few videos of just looking at old MCNs. When I first started, I kept mm. every single MCN I was in because um, I didn't think the dream would ever last. I ended up stopped doing it in like 2020 or something when the stack got too high. So I went back and talked about certain road tests and mics, you know, not just what the bike was like, but what, you know, the, the industry was like at the time, what was going on at the time. And then started to get a lot of questions in the comments. And then inspired by Justin Hawkins, of all people, watching one of his videos by accident. And he was doing his Q&A. And, and so Justin Hawkins is? He's the, um, the darkness singer. Right, I'm okay. not really the a darkness pitch, fan. That's it. Yeah. But he's a really interesting guy and people were just asking him questions. And I thought, well, maybe I could do a similar thing for bikes. So mm -hmm. I end up, ended up doing these weekly, you know, thanks for asking videos where yeah. people ask questions and, yeah, you can just give them your benefit of your experience. I'm jealous of that, if I'm honest, because it's, it's one of those like, oh, shit, that's a good idea. Because it's, it's not, again, it's, it's so difficult to go out. If you want to go out and do a motorcycle review or mm. you want to go and do a proper feature... You need, people are so critical about sound, video. Yeah. Like you need a professional, both of those disciplines. You need time. You need a whole day, sometimes two days. Yeah. You've got to get a hotel somewhere. You need money. You need all this stuff. And I'm not saying you should never do that, but it's it adds like labor and intensity. Yeah, whereas yeah. that thing that you've got there is, you can just, you can do it with a phone. Yeah, you exactly. To, you, know, you, don't, you don't have to have this amazing no. stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And that's a perfect example of, I think, what the type of content that YouTube is feeling safe to promote. There is no dangerous riding. There is no loud exhaust. There is no, no exactly. yobbish sort of stuff. Even if you drive around like Miss Daisy, it still seems that whether it's the audio quality, YouTube's just not interested. Mm. Whereas opinion pieces and personality... Um, that is a is a is a favourite, and you can see it in your in your video, like a reflection of your. The views are so much higher, aren't they? Yeah, in exactly. those ones. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 
it's a dark art for sure, but it's a, it's a great, I, I really enjoy it. I, I enjoy doing, I mean, my first MCM video, I think it was like 2006 or something like that. So at the time, none of us knew what we were doing. None of us had been taught, you know, how, how do you present? You know, I guess the only references back then would be Top Gear or, or something like that. There was no other YouTube channels. So it's kind of taught ourselves as we've been going along and doing my own videos has helped me with my MCM videos. You, you, mm. You've seen launch environments. It's very hard to make a video at a launch. And how and how was uh, how are MCN with your own stuff? Um, well, I make sure it doesn't conflict with anything I do at MCN. So I'd, <clears throat> I'd never do a, a new bike review, for example. Yeah. Um, but you know, I talk about what I do at MCN in my videos. They haven't told me not to do them. <laughs> <laughs> it's got. I mean, it's got to help them, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And, and this is why. We off camera were saying actually that, that it would be difficult to do because we want to do a podcast on 44 Teeth, but at the moment we've got so much going on, it'd be and yeah. it's so hard for us to be in the same location. And you really need if you're going to if we're going to do it right on for, on a scale that 44 Teeth should be doing it, it needs to be committed yeah, like every, yeah, exactly. at least one a week, smashing it out. Um, but it would be, I don't think MCN would be particularly happy if you were on a 44 Teeth podcast, no, no, exactly. So but this is the beauty of having your own individual outlets. Mm. Like you may, you may start a business and do whatever in, in your future with motorbikes or whatever, but you'll still always have Nevesy Bikes yeah. what, because that is you. Exactly. And, um, and I think the value, particularly from what MCN get, you know, how many times have you said MCN in this podcast? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it, it's part of, it's, it's an extra feather in your hat. Yeah. And hopefully they feed each other. Yeah, you know, well, it's the same way that, that this channel feeds Forty Four Teeth. Mm. You know, with, I'm, I'm pretty without. You know, when uh, we had that kickstart with Forty Four Teeth, where I'd already had a pretty decent following. I think I had hundred thousand subscribers mm. on YouTube when Forty Four Teeth was started. So it was like, hey, I'm doing yeah, this thing. Of, yeah. So we had that influx. The the peop, the party started. You don't have to sit there being the lonely guy. You know, just yeah, drinking a pina exactly. colada like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're here for the party. <laughs> you know, there was already a bit of a vibe, which was useful. And I, and I think and people who are too insular and go, oh no, I can't do that with them. They're they're they're, mm. they're the enemy. Yeah, yeah. I think they're 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 strangling themselves. Um, yeah. I think there's enough there's enough <clears throat> to go round. And it's just another social media outlet isn't it you know you can you can have your own twitter account and facebook account or, or instagram and mm. youtube's just the are you, are you big on socials how, how do you what's your well i suppose you know being there at the beginning of facebook you kind of people are naturally nosy aren't they well i am i like mm. to see what other people are up to and then you kind of got are the you, race... are you one of the stalkers do you have like fake fo facebook no, accounts no, no, like, I don't, oh, no. what are they up to dig out your ex-girlfriend yeah, yeah exactly look at that. <laughs> but now I, I enjoy, I enjoy Twitter because it's kind of as a news source. Mm. I never really get involved too much with, you know, conversations or anything like that. But if you, you know, really into motorbike racing, for example, you can you can get the stories from the horse's mouth. Yeah. So and like it's it short form as well. It's, yeah, it's like exactly. I just want to blip. I want to. I want to. I want to know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not not so keen on Facebook anymore. Um, no, I don't think know. anyone. It seems no. it seems like quite uncool. I mean, I, I deleted my Facebook account five years ago now, probably something like yeah. that. And sometimes I regret it. I'm like, oh, should, that would have been quite useful. But yeah, yeah. whatever, it's gone. Um, but it almost seems a bit like the kids are like, oh, my mum's on Facebook. Exactly. You know, it's a bit yeah. dreary. Yeah, it's exactly. Bit, it's a bit, oh, yeah. mum and dad are here, you know. So I've joined TikTok recently, but I don't really understand wow. that. I don't understand that. So I don't the really, youth. I don't really feed that. We've got a TikTok channel as well that, again, um, Rixie was like, you guys need a TikTok. Because yeah. we, we, we were working with uh, some new brands and they were like, right, so what have you got on this following, that right, following? Okay. And what's your TikTok? And we're like, we don't have one. Yeah, yeah. Why not? And I don't think, and, and again, it's difficult because does it, does it matter? It, it, it is, is our audience going to be on TikTok? Yeah, is it the same no. group of people? Isn't it? And, and is it the same group of people? Yeah. But I mean, I see TikTok as just you know underage teen girls mm. mainly. Uh, I don't, I don't, and, and it's like, well, what what are they going to want to watch our yeah, exactly. stuff for? Probably. So is it irrelevant? I think at this stage, perhaps. Yeah. But then, is it going to grow? I don't know. Um, so does social media help uh, Forty Four Teeth's YouTube channel at all? Yes. Um, 
but most of the video like it would be it would still be 90 percent of what it is mm. if we didn't post on the other socials because youtube is a i think i class that one as slightly different that sort of that feeds its own monster yeah um, it feeds itself because it's got its own if you get a video in the sidebar of youtube you're golden so that's the goal yeah so but youtube's got to like it for that yeah. but it has its own way of dealing with things and it is i mean look i complain about it but it's a very impressive system mm -hmm. and uh and it's inverted commas free I mean, they take half of our revenue, yeah. which is a lot of money, and then they can't be bothered to tell us why we got our video yeah, exactly. declined. So th I do get frustrated with it, but it's it is a it's an incredible thing, and uh, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do the adventures I've done without it. What's so, your most successful forty four teeth video? How do you define success? Uh, okay, let's do views. Views. I think it's probably one of or a couple of the mega tests right um yeah the, so the so the big super bike test which we haven't done in a few years mm. um mainly because the, the, there's not many left no you know they're you, becoming if, more irre relevant as well because they're so good they are so good if you're testing a Prilia bmw and ducati they're all amazing just buy the one you fancy yeah uh, <laughs> what, what type of personality are you i think that's the key mm. you know uh, and I mean, yeah, I get I get criticised for my apparent bias towards BMW quite a lot. Yeah, but that's just because I've ended up at liking their products more than the other ones, yeah. and it's difficult to. Um, uh, it, it, uh, why should I not get to ride the bike that I want? Yeah, you know, <laughs> and just because. On a test, I'm always mm. as bi as unbiased as possible. You have to be but you can't help liking the one that you like. And I think that's important as a piece of communi communication, particularly if you've got Al, who's a bit more flashy and racy and wants yeah. to have the, the Multistrada, for example, rather than the GS. That's what, that's what arguments are about. Yeah. That's, what, that's what going for a, a ride with your mates and having a, yeah. having a dig at someone, for, oh, you got the old man GS of you. Yeah, well, yeah. Pff, it's carrying all your luggage, mate. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just bants. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so... I, I, if anything, I go harder on BMW, on launches and yep. uh, on other reviews and stuff, just because there is this perception of oh, Chris loves loves BMW. Mm. So I do, but it's almost it's almost like if your kid is you, you're the soccer dad uh, manager of the team, you know, under under 15s or whatever, and your kid's in the team, you can't be seen to give, an, no, give your right. kid yeah, a, yeah. a good right. So you go you go hard on him. Yeah, and um, yeah, some things BMW aren't very happy with me. You know, that's that, that's that's still. I mean, the GS for me is still the bike I I would never yeah. want to give up because it enables me to do things, and that's more important than setting a fast lap time. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. Uh, you're talking about what you know your friends think about bikes. As a road tester, you can never really give your opinion on bike a bike's looks because it's so mm. subjective, isn't it? So yeah. you only ever talking about a bike's merits or or otherwise but i've got a kawasaki uh, h2 sx this year as a long-term test bike and it's fine but it's ugly as sin mm. and uh, i was on holiday with my friends and none of them even wanted to sit on it because it was so <laughs> offensively ugly but you can't say that in a road test because no someone might think i did get in trouble with kawasaki though i did um i did say i can't remember where it was i think it was on a test but it might have been on new show wasn't it I did say that most Kawasaki's look like a uh, alien craft has crash landed <laughs> into a prosthetics factory, <laughs> exactly, and they weren't very happy with it. But now it's become this like in joke, and and but most people would kind of agree they're mm. not the most beautiful things. It's like it's like an Alienware gaming PC. That's what that's the brand yeah. direction they've gone down, and that's absolutely fine. And if you if you if, I'm sure if they wanted to make a more beautiful Panigale esque beautiful design thing. They mm. could if they set their mind to it, but yeah. that's not the direct design no. language that they've chosen to to represent. But are there any beautiful Japanese bikes at the moment? An R1 in race trim looks beautiful. It does look beautiful, yeah. But no, a not really. Bit ugly. No, they've all got this sort of mechanoid, mm. like robotic. Like I mean, I, I quite like the whole Dark Side of Japan MT mm. stuff that, that Yamaha's putting out. Oh, and that new Marlboro 
Yeah, um, XSR no, 900 GP, that looks nice. That looks pretty cool. But th again, that's a very acquired mm. taste. And if you're not into old bikes, you're probably not going to... Yeah. You'll be like, what's that weird Yeah, thing? exactly. Um, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. that might be because why European bikes are so successful now. I mean, 10 years ago, most people were still buying Japanese. It's a safe option. But now European bikes have come on so far and they're beautiful, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. You're right, and, and and maybe that's a slight reflection in society where everyone, most people can't ride a Panigale to its limit. Mm. Me, definitely yeah, included. most people can't. Like, you know, I don't think anyone probably can, no, actually. Unless really. you're a MotoGP rider. Yeah. yeah. So, so then the performance of any of these things, which is, as you know, you've, you, we've done it, you do these tests and the lap times are like within yeah. half a second exactly. normally covers the top three bikes, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not. It's tiny, tiny margins. So you might as well buy something that looks good, yeah. especially when you've got the social media world going. Oh, you've got a new V4. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That is. I mean, that is it. Doesn't matter. You're not going to get to the shops any quicker. No. But it looks absolutely drop exactly. dead gorgeous, and it's the bike to have. Yeah. yeah. If you turn up on a ZX10R, it's a brilliant bike. Yeah, yeah. But you're not going to get the kudos because no. it's not as pretty and it's not exactly. as influential and in this world of keeping up with the joneses sadly we're raising an army of people who are very concerned about how things look so yeah maybe yeah, it is yeah. something to do with the lack of japanese um products but then <laughs> performance wise it's actually generally the europeans that are on top te top of the tests as yeah. well isn't it so yeah. it's not just um it's not just how they look no exactly um, and what is up with their abs systems and they're, they're, awful. they're so I mean, you know better than anyone. The R1 standard ABS is virgin on dangerous on track. I think it. I, d I think it's beyond verging on dangerous. Mm. It, it, it absolutely is dangerous, and um, I just don't see how Ducati's system is incredible. The new BMW system is yep. incredible. Um, Pretty is not so bad. That's kind of halfway house. Yeah, isn't it? but why? Why can't? Mm. Yeah, just turn it off. Just give us a button to turn it off. That'll do. Yeah, because if you're riding close to other riders with that ABS, you don't know if you're actually going to stop or not. No, so you end up... I, I do this thing on my Japanese bike. I'll, I'll at least roll mm. for a second before hitting the brake. Yeah. Just to sort of... Yeah, you can't go... Poof, just you to just get... You don't that. know it's going to be there. You don't. No. And, and it's it's terrifying. Yeah. 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 But I'd agree with you about the GS. I think that's probably... I, I don't want to like it. But, nobody, but it's, when you ride one, it's just brilliant. It just... It's an enabler, and it's mm. and and there's nothing cooler. I think it's cooler pulling, you know, a proper minger of a wheelie on a fully loaded yeah. GS than it is on any superbike. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a monster. Yeah, you know, exactly. The adventure spec. Look at that. It's, and and now, and you mentioned this on the video. Was it last night? About how even those that you're a sports bike guy, but even, you know, the performance level of these mm. middleweights and adventure bikes has got so good now that it is at the same street performance level as yeah. super bikes. 100%. Maybe beyond because... More accessible. More accessible, easier to ride, softer, more compliant, and they, they often come with better tires, as yeah. in more, more British road-worthy tires, bigger front wheel. Yeah. You know, it, 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 they are... Amazing, these new, these new. What about the new GS? What do you think on that? Yeah, I think. Well, I had a bit of a. Because interestingly, I was on the launch recently. I was supposed you were going to be, gonna be weren't you? Yeah, and I think they did a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a boo boo really because they. BMW UK and dealers weren't expecting that bike to be in the dealerships mm. as soon as it was. Yeah. Like we got invites two months before the event. Oh, wicked. And yep. I love a GS. Yep. Love it. Super excited. And then about a week and a half before, I started seeing these videos pop up on YouTube about bikes in dealers. And I was like, yeah. uh, hang on, aren't, aren't, we, aren't we the press? Yeah. Aren't we supposed <laughs> exactly. to, do we not have an exclusive? <laughs> and, um, and it's like, oh, okay, well, hang on. It, it, a bike like that, the, they, the, the press or the influencers, whoever they've chosen to market the bike, need to be the first ones to ride it because mm. otherwise what's the point of turning up yeah. frankly if you know billy big balls or whatever <clears throat> his name is on youtube has just gone into a dealership in germany taken a bike out doesn't matter if it's in germany 
that we're a global language. They all speak English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's done his review and sucked up all of the sort of content yeah. on it. It's like, well, where's the exclusive there? What are we going to do? And, um, and it, this touches on the launch fever, I guess, uh, we, we spoke about earlier, the hard work nature of it. It's like, do I want to get up early, travel to the airport, mm. go out to Spain for three days? I know it sounds like first world problems. Be away from the office, loads of other stuff to do, come back, downtime, edit. It's a week. Yeah. It's a week for that bike. Yeah. When actually um, I could go to the dealership, take one out in a real world scenario, which mm -hmm. is a bit like your MCN 250. It's very different riding yeah. a bike that you just get the keys to and go off on it than you have day of pampering, mm. massaging. And it's it, it, those launches do affect you because you, you, you sit there and you hear all these amazing stuff about the bike and you can't help but go, oh, I quite fancy one of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't help it, can you? Mm. So it's a very different proposition. And and um, yeah, so I, I just said to BMW, like, I'm really sorry, but I just feel like I can't afford to come out and spend three or four days with you doing this when I could do a just the same job, maybe yeah. inverted commas, <clears throat> a better job. Yeah. When you're not riding around, like riding around with, you know, ducks in a row, everyone's videos are the same. Germany were out there a week before the UK anyway. Mm. There was no embargo on it. Yeah, right. exactly. Wow. So I didn't go. It was interesting when we were there because we were late on in the launch oh. schedule. Ah. Right, so sorry about that. The battery just uh, had to do a yeah. changeover, and we took advantage of the local cafe it and is. had um, I had a tuna fish jacket potato. With a lovely little uh, chicken wrap. I was quite jealous of your wrap. I think that was the way to go. Yeah. Anyway, where were we? BMW. GSs. What do you reckon? New one. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> again, I think I talked about my <laughs> bias for BMW, but I, I am a little. I'm not disappointed with the bike. But I'm a little wary, let's say, of the direction they've chosen to mm. go. I think maybe they are trying to chase the top level sport line headlines of yep. Multistradas, KTMs. Because a lot of people have, you know, it's like, oh, it's not as fast as a Multistrada, it's not this, it's not that. But that's not, to me, what a GS is. No. And a GS is an enabler, which lets me travel the world um, and... There's billions of accessories. Wherever you are in Europe, certainly, there's always a really good BMW dealership yeah. nearby. They can run on, you know, low crap fuel. They're just they're the workhorse that is comfortable, long range, yeah. and uh, a really nice place to be. The new one is excellent. Like, dynamically, it is... I, I guarantee if you put them on a track, it would be considerably quicker yeah. than, the, than the outgoing model. If that's what you want to do with the GS, uh, I would argue potentially it's not what you want to do with the GS. But it's great to have, nonetheless. But I think it might be to the detriment of the, the existing consumer. Uh, and I don't know if that's what people actually asked mm. for in the GS. And it's it's definitely a lot firmer and a lot racier. To me, it feels like a massive supermotor. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about you? I think for um, the kind of person that enjoys a GS, the the current one is is perfect. There's there's not a lot of things you could improve other than maybe things like an electric screen. Some people like adaptive cruise control yeah. instead of the standard stuff. Yeah. I mean, the electric screen. This one does have an electric screen, doesn't mm. it? Um, and it's. And it's actually pretty good. Now, why has it taken 20 years to yeah. appear on the flagship model when it's been on an RT since 2000? Yeah. God knows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Some well, I think, of those I think they've taken it in a sportier direction and I don't think the average GS owner is going to really want that. I think they've, it's a little bit of a step back in comfort, the seat comfort. It's quite a hard seat after a couple of hours. The ride is quite firm. Did you, do you find a difference? We were just talking off camera about, because uh, I, don't, I don't know what it recorded actually, but I wasn't at the launch. I did a UK thing. Mm. Did you find a difference between riding the bike out in Spain with the glitz and the glamour of EasyJet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, to the reality of a miserable day around Peterborough? Um, it's kind of <coughs> double-edged sword, really. I mean, yes, when you're in Spain in a nice location, riding on nice roads... You have a different experience than riding around the MCN 250, which is, I mean, we actually had a good day for it, but just normal, everyday roads. Um, there's 
the advantage of us doing an MCN250, we did it against the old bikes. So there's an immediate mm. comparison. Whereas when you yeah. ride a bike in isolation, you're not quite sure what the... So difficult, isn't it? Yeah. N no bike, modern bike in isolation <clears throat> is bad, is it? Exactly. Nothing. I think where, what a launch is really good for, for us, for MCN and for the magazines, is um, being able to immerse yourself in that bike, you know, for the time of the launch, speak to the engineers. And really, it's BMW's only chance to, to sing from the rooftops of that mm. bike and, 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 you know, dive deep into what it's got. After that, the, that's gone then. Yeah. Yeah, they move on to the next thing. Did the, were they talking about its sportiness? <clears throat> or its, was, it, was that they were, a... They were proud of its um, lack of weight. Which is a good thing. That's always a good thing. It right? is, but it's 12 kilos lighter than the old bike. We mm. put it on the scales. Mm. The, the weight figure they give is a Billy Basic bike. The ones we had, which I think the one you rode, the Tramontana yeah. Option 719, weighs 261 kilos in real life. Right, fully fueled. Fully fueled. So it's still a heavy bike. Yeah. But it does feel lighter, more agile than the yeah. old. And generally smaller, I'd yeah. say. Quite a lot smaller. Slimmer, smaller tank. Yeah. The, both bikes do the same MPG, more or less. Right. But obviously the old one can go further because it's a litre bigger. What about the gearbox? Because I, I, I'm... I, I've, it's, some of the, some of the, yeah, even the same model, mm. you, they can feel quite different. Like it could be exactly the same year of manufacture, yeah. but a gearbox feels a bit clunkier on one to another. That is a bit of a downfall. Some of the bikes I've ridden from BMW in the past, but I feel my current 1250 is a bit smoother mm. and generally just a rounded, softer bike to get on with. I know it's an adventure, and I do think that when they bring out the adventure version, I think that's going to be a, a very different affair. It's yeah. not just going to be the current 1300 with a big tank. I think it's going to be much more rangy. I think gem generally the new bike is is sharper, isn't it? It's stiffer. Mm. It's more urgent on the throttle, and the gearbox is kind of it feels crisper. I, I, we didn't have any problems with it feeling bad. No. But there's we we part of our test was with the pillion, and there's still that big gap between first and second. It's really hard to be smooth with. Yeah, pillion. really. It's, it's such a that's a funny thing. Yeah, it's, that's something you never. And if you unless you've ridden with a pillion, yeah. You're, they don't know when you're going to shift. Yeah. So you have to do this yeah, like, oh, hang yeah, on, yeah. hang on. Yeah. Um, and I had a few missed gears, actually, between fourth and fifth really? at the launch and, and here. Right, okay. I'm not sure if it's just my old drop foot, not um, putting it in positively enough. but Maybe. Yeah, so it's a great bike, like you say, but I don't really... Was it asked for? That's, that's, were I think were that's the GS question. owners asking for it? I, I, no. No, I think it was, no. a, again, a, 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 <clears> you know, just chatting shit with your mates down the pub. Oh, your bike's a slow old tractor. It's like, yeah. all right, well, it's carrying all your shit. You know? Exactly. Yeah. It's the donkey. But I love the donkey. And it's not a donkey. That sounds derogatory. No. It's, it's brilliant. You sink into it. All well, the bodywork wraps around you. It's smooth. The engine is more mellow on the old one. It feels nicer. Yeah. It's more live. I think it's like, uh, anyway. I think I said, on paper, the new one's better. But in real life, the experience it gives you. I think the old one is still brilliant. Here's a question, though. Would, if they're the same price... Which one would you buy? I think if I could take the electric... They're, so they're both, ban both brand new bikes, yeah. zero miles. I think the old one, if I could have the electric, electric screen off the new one. Yeah. The wind protection is su far yeah, superior. Yeah, it's much better. And yeah. if I could maybe have the adaptive cruise control. I wasn't a fan of that to begin with. But when you ride a lot with it, mm. it does make life easier. Yeah. But though the only two things, the two little toys it's got, yeah, the, the bike itself, I think I'd probably still have the old one. And it looks substantial, doesn't it? It looks like a big Tonka toy. It just, yeah. I like all, And I like the event with all the rails and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Over it. Yeah. The, I'm not sure about the new luggage. It's a bit executive. And, yeah. Anyway. anyway. It's still but a good bike. It, it's still, yeah, it's still going to be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, speaking of BMW, Top Rack, yeah. which is ha actually how he pronounces it. Yeah, I've heard him say, yeah. According to my video. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and everyone was like, even Top Rack can't pronounce his own name. <laughs> uh, BMW. I mean... <laughs> On the face of it, you think, why? What's he doing? I mean, I understand there's a political reason behind it, maybe. They didn't have his there? tummy tickled by Yamaha enough, really, when it came to the MotoGP. They gave him a ride on that bike, didn't they? And yeah. perhaps it was like, you know, you can have a go, but there's no future in it. Yeah, and just quickly on that point, Bautista didn't do very well at the weekend, no. did he? Like, really surprising. Like World Superbike times. Yeah. He said he wasn't... He was injured still from a high side at Jerez. Yeah. Because he was doing good times in previous tests, apparently. He was, yeah. But to race with those GP riders that know those real oh, unusual I mean, bikes inside out. Yeah, totally. But it's kind of, 
he was he was having a bad day mm. and maybe top rack just had a bad day on his yeah, exactly. gp yeah. gp sort of i mean if we don't see top rack emerge gp i will be really upset yeah I'm, i think it's a travesty it's, it's almost like it's gone now mm. like that that was the time and it, as you said it is a travesty i think he is the most talented rider across any discipline yeah. right now and it, what he can do with a bike even though it's so wild and you're just like anyone else you're just like they're gonna fall off any minute yeah yeah but he just never does he just it's doesn't amazing, do it he? it's just incredible yeah. so i think moving to the bmw he will make it he will make it go around that corner yeah and i think what he was upset about the yamaha it was just the power the bmw's got the power we've mm. seen that in bsb as well with with haslam's bike it's got the power it can't stop. It just can't stop. Mm. And if you want anyone to figure out how to stop a bike, it's, it's him, isn't it? Stop rack. Yeah. It's stop rack. Yeah. 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 So, and maybe BMW got something up their sleeve. I don't know. They seem to be pumping a lot of money and a lot of support into this. I think uh, Gintoli might be testing for it. Right, okay. So, Because you know, now Suzuki, they're out of EWC apparently. Yeah. Although I did get a <clears> message this morning from someone saying they were back in. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that'd be a massive coup for him, wouldn't it? You know, he, he developed the, probably the best MotoGP bike of recent times. I don't know, did he? The Suzuki, as he bowed out, it won, right, okay, it won yeah. a load of races and then Suzuki pulled the plug on it. That's a travesty is, as yeah, well. Yeah, which is just madness, but... Uh, yeah, in, I mean, and they don't even make a GSX-R in Europe anymore. No. No. And I think apparently the ones in the States are just old stock anyway. They're just getting That's rid right. of them. So no GSX-R line. And two years ago, they were MotoGP champions. Yeah world champions of the hardest most ridiculous fair enough it was a covid season but still yeah everyone you're still all on the grid still together on the grid together is that yeah one races yeah so but i it'd be great to see uh, top rack but he wasn't allowed to do the recent test was he? no and that's pathetic isn't it just come on yeah come he'll on be, everyone else is allowed. the next one because yeah. i did watch johnny ray's um little blog on his yeah. his channel about like he was uh, having fun know. on that yeah well he was set the fastest time yeah so but that's another world superbike rider that you wish had gone to MotoGP mm. and Foggy even. Maybe, that, yeah. That it doesn't, I wasn't that interested back no. then, so I don't really, don't really go Because there's always been that, that debate, who are the fastest riders, superbikes or MotoGP? Bautista didn't do the world superbike cause much good by finishing last, but no. he had other things going on, didn't he? No, but then he, I mean, he was in GP before, wasn't he? He mm. sort of took a step down, went to superbikes. Yeah, yeah. I think he's just found an amazing coupling with that bike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it might be different next year with the combined weight. It definitely is going to be yeah. different with the combined weight, and and that the whole the MotoGP tire pressure thing. Oh, yeah. what's, your, what's your opinion on that? So this is for you don't know. <clears throat> there's like a minimum uh, tire pressure that they're allowed to run for apparent safety reasons, mm -hmm. which has been advised by Michelin to not run it any lower. So now they're oh. checking the when they come in. Yep. Uh, if they've been cheating, inverted commas. I think um, they're obviously doing it to save their. Them, you know, getting sued in case. Yeah, Mitchell and I, yeah, yeah. 100%, yeah. And they've, they've, they've kind of uh, arrived in this situation because the bikes have evolved so fast mm. with the ride height devices and aero, and I think it's putting too much pressure on that front tire. Mm. So yeah, they've got to run it. But surely you say, this is what we advise, and here it is in writing: mm. do not run this pressure lower than that. If the rider and the team decides to do it. It's up to them, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Because now you can't, like, everyone was really struggling in the last round because of the temperature, the yep. tire, like, track temperature, ambient temperature. And you saw that the, like, well, Martin couldn't ride the bike, because mm. really, he's obviously one of them that runs it lower. Yeah, exactly. So, what, I mean, it's just like tire pressures, mate. Come, and then and th they don't want to crash. They don't want to fall off. They don't want to yeah. have their tire run out any earlier. They don't want a penalty in that way. But if they want to take the risk, if you don't want to take a risk, don't ride a MotoGP bike. Yeah. I mean, there's there's got to be there's got, there's got to be another way of dealing with it other than penalising people three three positions or something. Yeah, on, three seconds or something like that. Three seconds, yeah, three seconds race time. If you've seen to flout the lowest it's a pressure, shame. and how and the pressure change. I mean, the, listening to the commentary, the, the pressure changes mm. so massively. Anyway, like you, you could just be unlucky with the weather. Yeah, exactly. And then suddenly you're in the danger zone, aren't you? So you've got to then make it the bike harder to ride, i.e. more likely to crash. Saw a lot of crashes at the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Probably because they're all running their pressures higher yeah, than they exactly. normally would. So what's safer? Yeah. Because they're falling off anyway. 
And that could uh, determine a championship, couldn't it? Absolutely could, yeah. In, in fact, it whiffs a little bit of... I love Ducati, but it does... I, I feel a little bit... I said this on, on, on our news show. It, it's a bit like the Empire from mm. Star Wars. You know, that they. That I don't think it's fair to anyone else to have eight bikes on the grid. I think that's... Yeah. That, that, I think that's a massive advantage and it feels like they are going to do whatever they can to get their factory rider to win. Yeah, yeah. Which I understand, but and, and I would do the same. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they're playing to their advantages. It doesn't mean it's necessarily the right thing to do. No. And, it, and I, I really hope there isn't a situation where that tyre gets inflated on Martin's bike and it gets three yeah, second exactly. penalty. Because that's the kind of thing I could almost could see happen. happening. And you just think, I'm not to, you know, I'm, that, that's a, a, a crushing uh, <laughs> assumption that someone might do, but it would be an easy thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Uh, particularly when they're customer bikes. It's not like, they can, it's not like they're going to ask Honda to do it. It's within their control yeah. to go, should we take a risk on the tyre pressures? Yeah, 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 let's take a risk. Exactly. But I don't know about you, but can you even get your head around the tyre pressure changing when you're following another rider? As amateur riders, Yeah. something as as fine-tuned as a few PSI raises and lowers. A, I don't think I'd even notice. No. And B, I can't even get my head around why that happens in the first place. Obviously it does, but they, they're at such a high level, it's hard to relate to, isn't it? I mean, how, how much does it change? It's got to be quite a bit. Because Yeah. I mean, they... Because they, well, they, one of the, they go out almost flat. They, they do, yeah, which is why the, turn, like the first corners, or like the first laps are really mm. difficult. Yeah. Um, so it's got, to, it's got to change by at least... From cold going out, at least what six psi? Yeah, you yeah exactly. Thought? At yeah. least, yeah, I probably noticed that when you. I think you probably. I think yeah. you definitely know. It's, <laughs> it's almost like going into a wet corner, turn yeah, one, isn't exactly. it? Like, yeah, yeah. But then, if your minimum pressure, but surely the minimum pressure must be set for that turn one, that opening lap, right? That's the mm. minimum pressure set by Michelin because it's only going to over increase. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I don't know. It's complicated it's rules weird. and green paint. And again, that last World Superbike race, top rack. Just and then. Just on that little bit, and you just think, oh, really? If it was grass, it wouldn't have made any difference. No, I know exactly. rules are rules, but what a, what a sad what a ending sour end. yeah, to exactly. one of the best races yeah. I think I've ever ever seen. Exactly. What was it? Something like 50 position changes or something? Yeah. Amazing For the lead. race. Yeah. Definitely the best best racing to watch at the moment. I, it's I my, World Superbikes is my favourite yeah. category. Uh, and it's more relatable because it's like, you can still go out and buy an R1. You can go and buy... Yeah. I mean, I know they're completely different yeah, exactly. bikes. So anyone that actually bases their buying choices on that is probably not wise. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're completely different things. But yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, for, for years in 1,000cc group tests, you'd have ZX10s coming last in our tests. Because you know they're a little bit wooden and not so good compared to a Ducati. Yeah, for or example. they're geared to do like two hundred yeah. miles an hour, and it's the first gear is so long. Yeah, but at the same time, Johnny Ray's world champion. When yeah. people are like, well, why are you, you know, why are you saying that? You must be uh, getting brown envelopes. Well, yeah, I mean, we often discussed <clears> if we're allowed a, 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 to do a ne the next mega test or whatever. I know you've got to test it as the factory as it comes. Yeah, you get. I mean, you're going to tie yourself in knots if you don't do that. But even if you got three or four hundred quid to spend on some bits, because if you put a proper chain and sprocket gearing mm. setup on that ZX10, yeah, it would be it would be and change two the ABS. seconds two seconds quicker, yeah. yeah, and turn the ABS off exactly. It'd be two yeah. seconds a lap quicker, yeah, yeah. So, and then it would be right up there with the rest of them. So definitely, which again they can change their gearing as well. But the Europeans seem to be geared a lot yeah. shorter than the Japanese. For some reason, I don't know why they do it. Our one's the same. Mm. Massive. And the bikes are roomier generally. Yeah. The Catties are more comfortable, aren't they? It's amazing now. Better, better the, around the track as well. The, the, jumping on the new V4 is, is like getting in an armchair. Yeah. It, and it's like, what? And it's become such a good road bike as yeah. well compared to the, the, what it used to be and compared to the Japanese competition. Yeah. So, Why do foot pegs need to be so high and screens need to be so low on blades and ZX10s? Because you'd change all that anyway if you were racing. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to make a height assumption then, but I probably won't. I'll get myself in hot water. Should we, um, should we do some questions? Why not? I've got some. Yeah. I asked, let me just grab my phone. I asked, um, I asked the Minions last night. Okay. Uh, the, well, I said, I stated I was seeing you. On the Instagrams. On the Instagrams, yeah. 
So I haven't picked any just yet, but I'll just flash up a <clears> couple. And we'll, do a, we'll do a quick fire uh, to end the show, because we've been going for quite a while now. So, um, yeah, let's finish off. All right, how do you do this? No. Uh, well, a lot of responses, you'll be pleased okay. to know. Um, oh, this is actually, this is the first one I've read, and this is actually quite good. So this is from... This is, we want quick answers okay. ish here. Quickish. Uh, Ped Buck 90. Hello, this Ped. is for you. So, if you were to choose a budget bike battle, what bike, uh, what would the bike category be? Oh, not one that you've already Could be done. Anything, anything. Anything you want to do? Uh, maxi scooters. Maxi scooters. Yeah, T Maxes. I love myself a T Max. Yeah. The T Max Tech Max. Yeah. Tech Max. Tech Max one of my favourite bikes. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I'll go big scooters. Big scooters to Rome. Big scooters to Rome. Yeah. I'm in. Do you want to come on the next one? Yeah. Would you be allowed to come on the next one? Is that a conflict? Oh, I think it might be a conflict. Yeah. But if it, what if you just took a holiday? Yeah, maybe. I'll ask the boss. <laughs> um, there's another one that's very similar. If you had four grand to spend on a BBB bike. That's the thing, a T-Max. They're quite expensive still, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, Best, this is from WJV underscore H. Very catchy name. Hello there. Uh, best road bike to convert for track bike use. <clears throat> I guess we're talking sort of current crop. In fact, anything, whatever. S1000RR, because it needs yeah. so little doing to it to be a track bike. It's got fantastic brakes. Gearing's pretty much spot on, more or less. Just put some tyres on it and off you go. Suspension's yeah. brilliant. Okay. I, I'm not going to complain with that. No. Um, best bike you have ever ridden from Paul Hughham, Hochham, 942. Uh, Ross's M1. Shut up. Yeah. It's, Did got, you? it's got to be that, yeah. What's Two, your, what year? 2006, the camel colours. Oh. So just because of the whole experience, you know, just actually, because the good thing about riding a bike is it's just you and the bike. Once you've rolled down pit lane, no one can tell you what to do or how to ride or whatever. And it was a, a journalist test that they used to do at the end of the yeah. Grand Prix season. And I'm out on track with a load of other Grand Prix bikes. So you're sort of living your MotoGP dream for a few laps. On and Then that's something that stopped these days yeah. as well. You don't yeah. get that until... That stopped. The uh, last one was 2007 when I rode the whole all of the 990s and all of the 800s. And then in the second year of 800s, they stopped it. It was when... They went to the control Bridgestone, so that might be a reason because you can't ride them slowly, can you? Because they need mm. the heat in them. And it was becoming a little bit of a, a circus, really. You know, a lot of people were riding the bikes. It used to be, you know, back in the day, in the late 80s, Alan Cathcart used to ride race bikes. It was pretty exclusive. And mm. then th that kind of got bigger and bigger. But, yeah, getting to ride the full set of bikes and riding Ross's bike and seeing his little Ninja Turtle on the top yeah. yoke and the Doctor down the screen and his, there was a PlayStation sticker on the tank wow. and like this is amazing wow. and and they all felt like the best versions of the road bike so his felt like an r1 but amazing right. nikki hayden's felt like a blade ones that are slightly different suzuki had a v4 then so obviously that didn't feel like a gsxr but the kawasaki felt like the best zx 10r the ducati felt like a 999 yeah that's pretty special mad I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity to ride a proper race bike mm. like we all think we can build track bikes yeah. in our garage but we we can't and <clears throat> i would just love to be able to feel what a proper bike should feel like yeah. like a world super bike doesn't have to be a gp bike no. in fact i think a gp bike would probably be a step beyond but like a, a or a bsb bike something that's absolutely like sorted set up for your weight you got a rider yep. you got a tech in the garage it's like right we're going to do this do that i just love it because you could i would love to know what how easy they are to turn how amazing the brakes are how mm. stable they are and how you know because apparently they're a lot easier to ride well that's the thing that that's the thing that is the big surprise how mm. easy they are to ride at your pace obviously when yeah. you ride at their pace they become animals but they've got the best plushest suspension they've got the grippiest tires they've got the most progressive mm. brakes they've got beautiful power delivery they're just mm. the, the throttles are just like butter and because the bikes know where they are around the track mm. The bikes will only have enough power for that first gear hairpin and no more. Only have enough power for that third gear corner and no more. They're just just beautiful to ride. They're not. They're, they're as far away 
from a gnarly uh, home tuned <laughs> super bike or <laughs> club racing bike as you could ever get. Yeah, I can imagine. And that's what happens when you've got the best of the best components set up by the best of the best people and, you know, that's what wins by racing. the best riders. Well, if anyone out there wants to lend us a couple of World Superbikes, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll do a couple of laps. Um, <clears throat> what else have we got here uh, on my list? Uh, ben Dyer just says you're a brilliant guy. Oh, thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, Read that one out again. Uh, a brilliant guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, best, so this is from Shyam Essie. Best way for a beginner to get into track riding. Best bike, best UK track, mm. do any courses. I mean, there's quite a lot to digest there, but I think the, the general how to get, because yeah. I get that question quite a lot. How do you get fast? Mm. It's a shame the Ron has some race schools finished now, because that was a really good introduction into track riding in a really safe environment. That's stopped now, unfortunately. Um, why, why did it stop? Because well, Honda used to support the school. Uh, and I think money. Honda pulled out. Mm. Mm. Which is a bit of an institution, really. I think mm. it was going for 26 years. Sure. And it kind of dealt with new new riders, new track riders, road riders who wanted to go on track. Um, but I think now is really to, you know, there's lots of novice-only track days. I think they're a really good thing to go to. Even if you go and check one out before you actually go and ride, just so you can get a feel for the place. And they're normally quite low pressure. In terms of bike, you want something that is going to be easy to ride, not eat tyres, you know, something middle weight, something small. Mm. Yeah, it's funny. I used to advise people to get like a 600 mm. or something like that. But actually, something like an S1000, yes, they are ridiculously quick. But you stick that bike in rain mode or something. Mm. Yeah. And you could ride that all day with the safety features and everything around. So... It, I think electronics has got such a part to play. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to advise people to do these days. But it's an I, interesting kind of new breed of bikes, like the R7 and the yeah. R660, and now Fantastic the GSX8R. Well. Yeah. Um, but the trouble is with those, the track day groupings don't really suit those bikes. I think no. the grouping should be more capacity and power rather than ability. Yeah, there's a, there's always someone on an S1000 that's going to wallop you yeah. down the straight and then stop. 10, you know, 20 metres too soon before the corner yeah. and, you know, wobble around it. So your CF motor you race, would you really want to take that out on a fast group track day where it's full of R1s? You'd yeah. be wincing yeah. the yeah. whole time. I'd, I'd, like, I'd take a GS. I I'd, I'd like... I like. <laughs> they wouldn't get past you, would they? No, <laughs> put the panniers on. Yeah. I like impractical bikes on track. I think yeah, it's yeah. fun. Because, I, I th again, for me, particularly UK, it's different in Spain or somewhere hot and sunny and, mm. and almost always perfect track temperatures. Yeah. And well, condition but i think in the uk it's it's so it's so busy as well it's so difficult like on modern uk track days i'd just take something stupid yeah, and just yeah. have a go because it doesn't matter what you're on no and anything is fun at the limit isn't it yeah or near exactly. the limit yeah in fact you could argue that a brand new r1 won't be as fun as a, uh, an old C no. an old milli r or something be because fun for three laps before it absolutely knackers you out and then yeah and and, and then you get you go back and, oh you weren't faster than the session before yeah, what's exactly. going wrong with the bike and you get caught up in your own head just go mm. and ride something yeah exactly hmm. so so best way for beginning to get into track riding uh novice track days novice track days and, or, or a good group of mates and appropriate got... tires a lot of people just mm. stick race tires on their bikes for they're just hard to manage. They only work in certain conditions, and yeah, get get appropriate tires. That's a good one. And then don't buy. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, I was talking about tires and people who buy them off uh, ex race teams yeah, and then completely. ride them down the cafe and yeah, you're like, "What are you doing, mate? Yeah. Well, I've got these. Uh, you know, these exactly. are Leon Haslam's uh, Superbike tires. Great. Well, good luck around that corner exactly. over there. Tires that's designed to work at eighty degrees and above. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, a good, a nice sporty road tyre exactly, would be. Yeah. It's absolutely perfect, wouldn't it? Um, here's a good one from Beamer Spirit. Most fun road bikes currently on sale? Or road bike currently on sale? Uh, I'd have to say, Most I mean, fun. it's a lot, big uh, Super Nakes, obviously. That's an obvious one, isn't it? MT10s yeah. are really good fun. Mm. But I think the um, sort of new breed of middleweight's probably the most fun because they're not too over the top. A KTM 890 Ju car, really yeah. good fun. MT09 SP, that kind of it was a 990 Ju car. Now they're getting bigger, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's bigger than the original. The original was 950. 
Yeah, and pretty much the same horsepower, I think. Yeah. I mean, hypermotards, they're good fun, but really impractical. What do you think, do you think of the new, new Ducati one? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is it? I don't. I don't know either. But then they're, 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 they're supposed to be going to motocross soon, aren't they, Ducati? Yeah, right? yeah. So, they've announced that. Yeah. So, so again, the, the sort of the emperor, the, the empire is expanding yeah. really quite rapidly, exactly. which is which is great. Yeah. But it does seem like they're taking. They, they've got a lot of investment or infrastructure or whatever they're doing. They they're going all in, which is great. Um, do I need a big single Ducati? Mm. I don't probably not, but I can imagine it's going to be an amazing yeah, love. Yeah, fun. Yeah, um, and if if you're a Ducati customer, because let's face it, those bikes ain't cheap. Mm. So you've probably got a Panigale anyway and a Multistrada. So why not stick a hooligan mm. bike to a couple of hours smash, on a Sunday smash morning. around the lanes? Exactly. And I think, you know, if they can sell it, they'll make it. What's your favourite fun bike? Oh God, don't ask me questions like that. I'll be here forever. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, my, my, my idea of fun has changed a lot mm. in recent years, and it was always a superbike, and it was always a, you know, getting that max of that thrill and the rush of the pure speed. But the way the roads have evolved, the dash cam wave of people, just the way. I mean, when, when was the last time you saw anyone just even overtake a car, mm. like, like a, a car overtake a car on a on a normal road? It just doesn't happen. Anti-social anymore. now. Just it, it, it just and even if you do, someone's flashing yeah. you. Oh, you maniac! So it just, I just the 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 paranoia of going fast, fast has totally yeah. drained. Yeah, yeah. You want to have your fun at at low speed speeds. yeah and all the modern super bikes are so capable mm. that below 120 mile an hour you might as well just be yeah. just whatever just pottering along because they just don't even feel that fast yeah, so yeah. so i guess i'm i would lean towards an older bike mm. um for more character yeah uh, i've definitely got into older ducatis recently yeah, yeah. low well inverted commas low capacity there were super bikes at the time but they're still only 110 yeah. 120 brake horsepower um so yeah i think fun is a different yeah it's just got a different connotation mm. to me but uh, and again wheelies and stuff you, you get banned in this country if you're in the states you know if yeah. you, you don't understand how strict it is if you, yeah. you put pop a wheelie in front of a policeman here you're you're gonna gonna lose your license yeah yeah exactly um and so the, <laughs> the consequences are so bad so for whatever fun you might have the mm. guilt for the next three weeks going where's that letter yeah gonna come exactly. through the post box yeah. um so I think, yeah, chilling on an old 916 would nice. probably be... You can't beat the sound of a 916. No. Proper Ducati sound. Yeah. I actually recently just acquired a 999R as well, wow. which was a bit of a left field choice. Yeah. But again, it was, a, it was a good price. And it's one of those... How do you... I mean, it's a... It's a we'll, we'll have a... Uh, I'll do some video on this anyway, but it's a... How do you follow the 916 in yeah. terms of beauty and design? Widely regarded as the most beautiful bike ever yeah, made. Yeah. You've got to be left field, haven't you? Yeah. And then you come up with a 999. I um, think time's been kind to the 999. I think it's, I think it's been exceptionally kind to it. Yeah. Like you look at it now and you go, huh. really I mean, nice look, it's, not, it's not classically beautiful, no. but it's got a, a very interesting yeah. face on it. And actually, you take away, you, you, on a race bike, you smooth that headlight out. It is a Ducati, mm. quite clearly. That like You can see it. But it's just the sort of headlight configuration. But um, yeah, I think it's one of those things that's been kind. And also, they didn't sell very many, mm. of the, especially of the R bikes, the expensive ones. So as an investment type product, yeah. the rarer the bike, the more money you can ask for yeah, it. So. Really good bike. Uh, mine's, leaking, mine's leaking oil already. But oh, anyway, lovely. There we go. It's only a little wee wee. Um, mm, 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 mm. What else have we got? We'll do a couple more and then. Oh, here's a good one. You touched on it earlier. What inspired the helmet design? And that's from Bainesy 301. Ah, oh, Bainesy. Well, like I always wanted to be a journalist. Always yeah. wanted a custom painted crash helmet. Used to, Kevin Schwantz, I used to want a Schwantz lid when I was younger. I got one of those. But um, the design was designed by Rich Art, who's a yeah. really good painter at Birmingham way, I think. Yeah. And it was, what I wanted was, it was inspired by... A, Fat Boy Slim concert on Brighton Beach where he beamed a smiley into the sky. So I asked him for a smiley in the sky and he came, kind of came up with that plus plus the stripes. 
And then they actually made a replica of that helmet in 2005. Yeah. And um, but we couldn't have this. They had a smiley one side, Union Jack the other side. But you'd have had to pay a royalty to the smiley man to produce it. Is that still... That Really, but it's an emoji. Yeah. So, so, so does, I, he I, get, does he get a, a, a load of money every time you every send time a smiley maybe, face? Yeah. So we ended up breaking it up into half and half, half a Got you. like half a disco biscuit. A disco biscuit. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But when they sold, I mean, it, you they were at a Fat Boy Slim concert. Exactly. So, yeah. so they weren't allowed to. Um, the, the 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 eye and the mouth came separately in a sticker pack. In wow. the Yeah. So it, so it wasn't a smiley. Yeah, so that's that's where that came from, huh. and I've kept it ever since, and it's quite distinctive. It's nice. I like I like I like consistency. I'm still mm. waiting for. My, I mean, I I got my I only got my first custom helmet last year, the the pink one. Yeah, with the, yeah, yeah. And and yeah, which I kind of I like design and stuff, so I sort of put a design together and got Liam at LDC Designs to to paint it up for me, and, and it's nice having a mm. a bit of. I don't like race rep helmets from other people. Mm. I don't want to look like Danny Pedrosa. Yeah, yeah. I, I want either my own thing or a, or a plane. It's a nice feeling picking it up every time. I, I yeah, still, this is I me. still love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I took my race rep, my full-on race helmet on budget by battle on an old RT, so it was perfectly, <laughs> perfectly suited. Yeah. Well, look, man, we've got um, we've, we've, uh, battery's about to go again, so um, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's flown by. It has flown by. See, this I'm, is why I like this. I could do it. I could just do it all exactly. day. We haven't scratched the surface. We haven't scratched. We have to right. do it again. Yeah, I'd love to. Let's do it again. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming down, mate. No problem. Thank and you for uh, having me. Yeah. yeah. Good luck with it. I'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. And thanks, guys, for watching, listening, wherever you are. And also, because this is the first one, apart from maybe a test I'm going to put up with uh, my mate Charlie, um, feel free to comment. Like anything's annoying to you, apart from us, obviously, <laughs> um, or anything you think that you want to. A change. We're, I'm pretty new to this, so we'll 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 get the system right. Um, but failing that, we can travel around wherever with this with this. Yeah. Get up and um, you know get whoever we want. Yeah. So. Anyway, thanks again, man. No worries. Thank Take you. Take it easy. <laughs> That's a wrap. A chicken sees a wrap. Brilliant. Oh, thank you, mate.